Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Grand West Casino and Entertainment World in Cape Town, South Africa, where tonight's entertainment is proudly presented by Tireholics Fight Promotions. It's TFP for full swing. All bouts have been sanctioned by the South African Muay Thai Organization and the World Muay Thai Organization. We got 10 bouts lined up for you on an action stack card tonight. No less than three ladies bouts in the Muay Thai divisions. Two South African WMO championships are on the line. And of course, our main event, an absolute cracker for the WMO International Welterweight Championship over five rounds between the holder of the belt, Pasquale Amoroso of Italy, and South Africa's Nedo Gomba. Ladies and gentlemen, this is TFP4 Full Swing, and it starts right now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Carl Bergman. I'll be bringing you commentary tonight. and Welcome to tonight's entertainment on TFP4, Full Swing. We have 10 action-packed bouts for you guys tonight. And as you can see on your screens, tonight's scoring will be done on a 10-point must system. That means round by round, the judges ringside will be scoring. The winner of each round receives 10 points, with the loser receiving 9 points or less. The judges are looking for effective strikes, clinch control, overall dominance and well-rounded performance from our fighters. We'll be kicking the card off momentarily with our first five bouts, which are amateur bouts. And soon we can switch over to Devon and he can cue us in. Ladies and gentlemen, the first bout on this evening's card to go distance of three rounds by two minutes in the welterweight division with amateur rules in application. Introducing to you first, he'll be fighting out of the blue corner, standing 1.75 meters tall and weighing in at 67.15 kilograms with the blue trunks making his amateur debut. He fights out of Pride Fighting Academy in Cape Town. Please welcome Kyle. Eckerman! And his opponents will be fighting out of the red corner, standing 1.7 meters tall and weighing in at 65.9 kilograms. With the red trunks making his amateur debut, fighting out of Domination Gym in Durban, KwaZulu Natal, please welcome Prishen Govinda.
All right. We kick tonight's action off. The guys will be doing their wide crew, sealing off the ring, and just preparing themselves mentally for this battle up ahead. It's a fight between Cape Town and Durban. We have Bushen come fighting out of Durban and Kyle fighting out of Cape Town with PFA. Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's so good to be back here at the Grand West Casino and Entertainment World. Cape Town is the place TFP for full swing is about to get underway. Amateur rules and applications, so three by two minute rounds. And uh, what you can see, cast the eye on the fighters. Protective gear on the elbows and the shins. Carl, you've been there. Does that count for much? At the end of the day, when you take a strike, it doesn't matter if there's a pad on it, you're going to feel that impact. It's still got all the brute force, but that's obviously just to help the guys prevent cuts. You know, you still feel those kicks we've seen in, in some of the fights before on other TFP cards. Those welts still come, you still feel that impact. So that's really just a, a preventative measure to help with cuts and so on. Blunt force trauma, that's what Muay Thai is all about. You know, these guys are just learning, both of them making their debuts. We're going to see if they've got a mastery of the basics, of course. You know, these kind of bouts absolutely intrinsic for what we're going to see later, the professional segment of tonight's fight card, which is where these guys started. They all were back in the day, the ones wearing the elbow pads, the socks, the crash helmets when they were younger. With exception of probably Nido Gomba, I'm sure he probably started <laughs> off in Thailand somewhere and carried on and then came back here and decided, I'm going to keep being a pro. I don't think that guy ever fought amateur. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. When you're fighting over in Thailand, even the six-year-old kids are walking around there and fighting with no headgear, no elbow pads. But, you know, in the Western-style sport version that we're seeing here today, it's always important to keep fighter safety. And a lot of these guys, that you know, might be a little bit wild. Their technique is a little bit uh, unpolished. So it'll be interesting now for us to see these guys in their debuts. Well, when the bell goes, the nerves are either going to be settled or they're going to be inflamed, and they're about to get underway. Three rounds, two minutes, amateur rules. It's the welterweight division that we're busy in tonight in the first bout of TFP4. Full swing, Kyle Eckerman in the blue trunks from PFA, Pride Fighting Academy in Cape Town, and he's up against Prishan Govinda from the Domination Gym, KwaZulu-Natal, Durban. Durban versus Cape Town, and here we go. You might find the familiar face of... The referee for tonight's action in the first part. Shane Deacon, no stranger. He's a champion from this very organization, and now he's giving back by refing these youngsters as they get off in their careers. Yeah, the super welterweight champion stepping in there, making sure that he is also involved in the sport, not just the guy in the gloves, but also helping with maintaining safety and, as you say, giving back. Good catch, attempted straight right hand down the pipe, fell a bit short from Prisha and Govinda. Both guys pretty measured starting out, which is good to see, you know, that means that they're well drilled, they're not coming out wild, the nerves are fairly settled, this is their first fight, it's especially in front of a big live crowd that we have here tonight, so yeah, it's good for them to start settled, that's also a very Muay Thai style as way, well. starting slow and feeling your opponent out before you get anything too crazy going. And what a place to kick off your career as an amateur or a professional in a place like this. You know, most of these guys, they do smoker shows. They're in the gyms, they're hidden away from the eye, you know, they're not on television. These guys, they're starting out on the internet worldwide through YouTube. Well, in every country except for China, North Korea and Iraq. <laughs> or Iran, one of those two. Um, but here we are from Cape Town. We're going live across the world with the beauty of Muay Thai for everyone to see. Kyle Eckerman is the one making all of the movements forward right now. Yeah, definitely has the reach advantage. His movement looks pretty good. I'd like to see the guys maybe get involved a little bit more clinch if they need to as well, especially if they're getting rushed. But they both, as I said, seem pretty measured, very good at maintaining distance. So we're not going to see too much of them in terms of clinch work. But that'll come. As they develop as fighters, they learn that if the space is closed, you can engage in the clinch. You can use your elbows and other weapons besides your basic strikes of punches and kicks. Oh, nice catch there, and he gets the sweep. That's what we're looking for things like this. Good Muay Thai technique. You know, these are things that should be drilled in the gym, not just about walking forward and throwing strikes. It's about, you know, having good presence of mind to catch those sort of kicks and to defend yourself properly. So the first round is in the can. The happier of the two, possibly Christian Governor, based on that sweep at the end of the round. I mean, that's the eye-catching thing for the judges, correct? Yeah, it should be, but of course, the leveler is the fact that Kyle was busy throwing a lot of strikes, landing some good clean technique. So I'd say it's pretty pretty tied up at the moment. We'll see as they progress if we start putting more pressure on as well. I think uh, 
Prashan looks a little bit tired, maybe in the corner, breathing a bit heavily. <laughs> that could also just be a dump of adrenaline right now. See, now how much is that actually going to take out of your stocks? You know, you can be training for weeks and weeks and weeks, doing all the road work, and then you lose it in the first round because of that adrenaline dump. That's a real thing. Mm, yeah, I remember when I started fighting, people used to say things like, this many rounds is how much you have to go through in, in the sparring environment just to, to try and emulate what happens in a fight. So um, the guys are going to be feeling that now. Uh, when they leave this ring tonight, they're okay, going to know they were in a fight. And not just from the way that they're being battered, but also just their own internal <laughs> energies that have been completely drained. As you saw in the replay there, Christian Govinder with that sweep that uh, caught the eye of not just us, everyone here, but the judges as well. And he starts straight away, as soon as they touch the gloves, being the aggressor. Yeah, and we've seen that from other guys from the Domination Gym as well. They have a quite an aggressive approach, and but their technique and styling is very good. They look for these sweeps. These are important things. Head kicks and leg, leg kicks, that's what the coach, Mike Monemini from Pride Fighting Academy is shouting at his charge, Kyle Eckerman. As we go into round number two, Govinda, the fastest starter in this round, and here comes Kyle with the flying knees. Yeah, I'm hearing Mike scream out those calls, but I would maybe be telling him as well to use his teeth, especially when uh, Prashen is putting on so much pressure, keep him away. But there you see, by following up, he's also got big, strong strikes. He's got that reach advantage, he needs to just, you know, use that to his advantage. And I think Eckerman has spotted a little bit of a gap down on the spleen area of Prashen Govinda. He hit it twice, he went for it a third time. Prashen had it, had it scouted. Shane breaks it there, turns him around, continues the fight. Round number two, one minute and 40 seconds remaining on the clock. Seems to have stopped working for some reason, so it's probably a little bit less than that. Good front kick by Kyle Eckerman. Keeps the opponent at bay, keeps you guessing. Yeah, it keeps you thinking. You never know where the strikes are coming from, especially as you get tired. You, just, you start to see a little bit less, things that are coming out of nowhere. See both of those punches landed, the hands are dropping a little bit. So take advantage, throw kicks to the head, throw the punches. That's exactly what Mike Minimini was screaming at him, to go for those shots. And he's zeroing in on that rib area again, looking for the punches to the body. Probably would have been suited if he had just sort of planted his legs and gave it everything he had instead of trying to do it on the fly. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes, obviously, when you jump in the air, you're getting momentum, so that does add to the strike. But, I mean, <laughs> you coming from a boxing background now especially, you plant your feet, you put it down, and that's going to give you that chain, that kinetic reaction from the floor to your arm, to your fist. Yeah, me being a or boxing guy, something I wish they had in boxing was buckets like these in the corners. <laughs> How smart is that? You know, you complain about the corners being wet. Obviously, the ring gets wet when you walk it into the middle of the ring. These buckets... Not a smart design, it's very simple, but mm. makes such a huge difference to the running of the rest of the night. You know, sometimes they're fighters who like to have a bucket poured over them. At least we're going to catch it, we're going to move it out of the ring, and the fighters are going to stay safe. There's not going to be any unnecessary fall downs uh, for moisture reasons in the middle of the ring. So, well done to, uh, to Ty Holic's Fight Promotions for bringing in that innovation. We've seen it in the last couple of events, but we've never really talked about it. Great idea. Yeah, and that's something that you see in Thailand. Almost every stadium has these buckets, these giant buckets. So, I mean, it's also part of reenacting what we see in Thailand and getting that traditional feel. Boxing, MMA, pay attention. <laughs> Get the buckets. <laughs> kind of difficult to throw a big bucket like that into an MMA cage, but I hear what you're saying. To over try and, you know, top, over, over safety the and so on. Frisbee, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Round All right, three. here we go. This is where it gets a little bit interesting now. Oi, just misses that head kick there. Oh, he looks for a spinning elbow, misses Privesh. Prashen ducks under, throws her own little back elbow himself. Interesting technique. It often works quite well if you step forward first and then push that elbow. Bit of a spear attack, but it obviously needs a base before you can push that out. Nice power coming there from Carl. You can see that Carl's got a lot more energy in this round. I think Prashen, he's still got something in him, but <laughs> you can see the way his hands are dropping, the way he's absorbing these shots. This is where the guy who's done more of the road work is going to start taking over in the deep, deep round number three of this three by two minute round. Opening encounter at TFP4, full swing. Good frontal kicks from Kyle Eckerman as he keeps it going. That's three in a row. Yeah, exactly. Using that range is something that obviously these guys are training a lot. 
they also, you know, coming from a more MMA style gym, you get to do things like that. The up kicks are good, gets uh, caught in the groin there. Referee Shane Deacon beckons them back to fighting. And so at this point in the fight where the guys are seem to go for broke, I think it's pretty close. Um, I maybe have Kyle in the lead at the moment, except for the fact that maybe Kushen caught a few kicks and sweeps. So interesting to see what the judges are favoring here. Every judge, you know, has a different opinion on what they feel was the better strike or catch or throw. The knees are important, the clinch work is important, and also just general dominance. So, you know, depending on what they see in the fight. An attempted swing or spinning elbow going there from Carl Eckerman, but he never really put much investment into that. That was very speculative. Yeah, it's also just in case, you know, it keeps your opponent away. I'd like to do a lot of spinning and following up if there's a kick or anything that goes after that. Great fight from the guys, especially on their debut. Great to see the sportsmanship as well, hugging it out at the, at the finish. Right, looking at the body language, the guys from the PFA corner look pretty happy with that. But I don't think they should be counting those chickens too soon. We'll see what the judges have to say about this. In fact, you know, keep those gloves on, you never know, you might have an extra round here. shots guys are getting a little bit tired there in that third round but this is where, where they'll learn <laughs> they'll learn about energy preservation as they go through these amateur bites and figure their fighting styles out and how to push and when to push all right referee Shane Deacon ready to announce the winners it looks like we have a decision Carl Eckman looks Positive, body language is always important. Ladies and gentlemen, the opening bout goes a distance of three rounds and we go to the judges' scorecards. Your winner coming by way of unanimous decision victory, fighting out of the blue corner and Pride Fighting Academy, Kyle Eckerman. See how much that meant to the guys. Elated in the corner there, Carl Eckerman winning his first fight in front of a live crowd. Great feeling for him. Not a bad job there done by Prashen. Came out fighting, just constantly game. It's also good to see. So as we said, we have five amateur fights on the card tonight. Most of these guys are making their debut, so we expect to see a little bit of, you know, wild exhibitions, but but at the same time, there's a lot of time for the guys here. They could have been putting in the hours at the gym, so we'll see what they have to show for us.
The following contest is the first featuring three title bouts or title bouts that are featuring women's Muay Thai. Amateur rules in application, three by two minute rounds, and it's gonna go down in the super bantamweight division. Ladies and gentlemen, making her debut, fighting out of the blue corner with the blue trunks, weighing in at 56.3 kilograms. She fights out of Fighters Inc. in Cape Town. Please welcome Sarah Fish. Now introducing and fighting out of the red corner, making her amateur debut with the red trunk swaying in at 55.7 kilograms. She fights out of camp fight in Cape Town by way of Pretoria Gauteng. Let's hear it for Verne Prinsler. Well, ladies and gentlemen at home, while they practice the Y crew, if you're watching us, it's because you found us on YouTube, the Tireholics Fight Promotions YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash channel, and a whole bunch of Zs, Ys, <laughs> underscores, and fives. But basically, Tireholics Fight Promotions on YouTube. Type That's it in your search us. bar, exactly. you'll find it. Follow us on Facebook, Tireholics Fight Promotions, Instagram, Tireholics underscore fight underscore promotions. Stay up to date with the play. And of course, we have an event that's already lined up 23rd of July, right here in Cape Town. It's going to be TFP 5. It's called Level Up. Grand West is the venue. The headliner is going to be revealed in the coming weeks. And it's going to be mixed card pros, pro ams, and amateurs. Also worth mo mentioning the return of Anthony Mailer. He's going to be fighting Pedro Kasoma. Obviously, Pedro is going to be fighting later in this card. Obviously, if he comes through unscathed, setting up the fight against Anthony Mailer. Shane Deacon is going to be making his return, taking off the ref's jersey and uh, not taking off his shirt altogether because he's going to be fighting. He's going to be up against Jean-Luc Ardendorf. It's going to be a title defense. Of course, Ardendorf won the Eliminator at TFP3, Continental Collision. Ixak Ibrahim, the champ, is back. He's up against Paul Combal. That's also going to be a title defense. So two WMO, South African national titles on the line, coming up. Grand West, 23rd of July, TFP5. And also, we got merchandise that's for sale here at Grand West tonight. If you're interested, place your orders. Admin at tireholics.com. Yeah, those uh, title eliminators were great fights on the last TFP card and the undercard there. It's also great to see some of the guys, you know, coming back into the sport. Paul Combal, I know, is out for a while. And, you know, he's been training back at MMA again, but it's good to see him in the Muay Thai gear. It'll be an interesting fight as well. I mean, he's here tonight. He gets to watch Pedro Kosoma uh, fighting Martin Avery later, and he'll get to have a bit of insight there as well. Up close and personal, as these two ladies are about to get up close and personal. Amateur rules, three by two minute rounds, super bantamweight division. 
Bernay Prinsler fighting out of the red corner with the red trunks. And she's going to be up against Sarah Fish from Fighters Inc. in Cape Town. Blue corner, blue trunks. Weight, pretty much the same, 55.7, 56.3. Not a lot of difference. And both fighters making their debuts tonight. So we're going to see exactly how far all of the training, the preparation, and of course, the effects of the famous adrenaline dump yeah. when you make your first appearance at an event like Tyholix Fight Promotions. There's uh, a lot of crowd support here for, for Renee. It's good to see the camp fight guys filling up the seats. Uh, both guys making their debut, both girls making their debut, but I see that Sarah's got a little bit of experience. She's done some white collar boxing and kickboxing uh, last year's medaling, you know, silver medal at the South African Kickboxing Championship. So, yeah, at least she's got a bit of experience there bringing forward. Let's see how she goes. Both these ladies come out of established camps here in Cape Town. Camp fight. David Dornbrack, the coach over there, he's produced champions out of that gym himself in both MMA and Muay Thai. Of course, Devin Ray Host, who's going to be later uh, featuring against Anisha Maiman. She's from Camp Fight. And here, Vinay Prince Luke, Camp Fight, with a lot of spectators calling her name when she got announced by myself earlier. Yeah, and again, there's uh, the Pro-Am title taking place this evening. Zoe Clarkson also fighting out of camp fight. She will take on Kristen Clark from Nakaeng. That'll be the opening of our main card later this evening. Sarah Fish, of course, fighting out of Fighters Inc. And these ladies are wasting no time getting stuck into each other. Yeah, it'll be interesting as well. But they might not be as used to the Southpaw style. I see that uh, Sarah's been switching between the two. We'll see which one she's more comfortable in, but it seems to be the Southpaw style. It's Bit of a blue corner thing because the fight before as well, featuring Carl Eckerman, he was seen to be switching between left and right. Sarah Fish doing the same thing in the blue corner tonight. Yeah, it almost speaks maybe a little bit to the gym that they come out of. You know, a lot of the MMA gyms are, are, are very keen on the idea of switching stances and being able to fight out of any position. It's quite important, but it also can add to your repertoire, but a lot of times it's also good to focus on that one style where you're most comfortable. Of course, because the combination of defense is always going to be more recognizable if you're always practicing it from, say, the right hand or the left handed stance. As soon as you start mixing up, you've got to know how to defend from all sides. For sure. Nice work in the clinch there. Both ladies landing some good knees. Rene using her reach, stepping back off the strikes and then countering. That's pretty good work from her there. Happy to throw that straight left hand of hers. Seems quite accurate so far. Narrowly missing with a swinging kick to the face. There's a whiff of the toes. Rene Prinsloo makes Sarah Fish pay for that mistake. Good work there, Narana Dean jumping in, refereeing in this evening as well. I happened to sit in on the referee's course while the guys were doing their refreshes, and it was, I was helping out with the sparring. It was just great to see that the guys, you know, these champions, former champions, Naran's actually scheduling to fight again this year, but giving back in different ways, and also enlightening themselves a little bit about the other role, the other role in the ring. The third person in there is the referee. Uh, as a fighter, it's always good to know what they're looking for as well, where they're going to, you know, maybe help and jump in. So you also have an idea, okay, the referee's looking for activity, so I need to stay active. As a ref, knowing what the referees are looking for, it gives them an insight on what they should be doing as fighters as well. And of course, if you're a ref and a fighter, no excuse for pulling the odd little cheaty cheaty. You've got to be straight down the line because then of course your refereeing is going to be called into, qu into question. As the two fighters are in the corners, the whistle goes, seconds need to get out right about now, and we're going to get underway with round number two. Yeah, so with these amateur bouts, we have a one-minute rest period in between. Pretty quick, but it gives you enough time to at least catch your breath, refocus a little bit, take in some instruction, maybe a little bit of water. And of course, suck in the ambience of the crowd that is shouting for Vinay Prinsler as they go to work in round number two. Vinay's pretty strong with the punches, good in the tinch. And that's important as well for Muay Thai styling. The judges will be looking on who's putting that pressure on, who's landing the team strikes as well. Not that Sarah isn't doing that, she's also doing the, the good work, but I think that Vene is maybe staying out of her range and then countering. So every strike that she that Sarah lands, vene has got one in answer. Good action so far from the first about three ladies, but of course 
in our announce that I butchered it a little bit. I was stuck on title fights because yeah. there are title fights coming up tonight. Sure. And there's a women's title fight coming up tonight. The WMO South African National Championship is going to be defended. Zoe Clarkson is going to be stepping into the ring. And uh, it's going to be action all the way to the end. Of course, our main event for the WMO International Welterweight Championship over five rounds. But as we focus back on the ladies here, Vene oh, yeah. Prince is making the most of the pocket. Sarah took a big shot there, but shakes it, shakes it off, shakes her head, sister. That didn't hurt. Comes forward with some punches of her. Both ladies have been very calm. No one seems to be panicking. There doesn't seem to be any messy kind of situations playing out with terms of gripping and holding and throwing. Yeah. I think it's also got to do with their range finding. So they seem to be pretty good at keeping that range, keeping that distance. I guess a lot of time when you're coming forward and looking for that closing that space, that's when you tend, tend to make those sort of mistakes and the wild rushes. If you want to look at feints in the sport, you're seeming to see a lot more feints coming out of Sarah Fish, throwing sort of, not wasted hands, but something that blinds Renee Prince. Yeah, it's maybe just to, to get a gauge on the reaction of your opponent. Put that foot down and see what they do. If they lift in the leg, you're maybe going to go under. You're maybe going to hop in and throw a punch instead of the kick. So yeah, sometimes you just use feints as a way to, to gauge reaction and see where we can work from there. Sarah Fish, the happier of the two, walking back to her corner with her hands raised. A reminder, there's a third round to come. Yeah, we're seeing some heavy breathing from both corners. Replays lined up, and here we go. Round number two is action. Both fighters really active and, and have a good combination of using their kicks and their punches, not just relying too much on the Moy Mat style, which is the punching. Uh, they, they're good all-round fighters, it looks like. Could I you like just to say that word again? Moy Mat. Moy obviously being the, the fight style that they're doing, Muay Thai, and Mat meaning punch. So a punching Muay Thai fighter. Can't get more blunt than that from the bluntest man <laughs> on planet Earth, <laughs> Carl Bergman. Of course, you fought in Thailand, you know the, the language pretty much of how they speak in terms of how they present fights. Yeah, but we also use the Thai language in our gym. We count in Thai when we, when we do our techniques and reps and we, you know, our coach likes to shout at us in Thai, so we do know <laughs> when he's shouting from the corner what he's saying. When he's telling us to kick and punch and elbow. Round number three underway, Sarah Fisher in the blue, Vernet Prinsloo in the red. Close fight so far, Carl. Yeah, last round for, for both fighters to put in that work and to convince the judges that they deserve that win. Big slip there from, from Sarah. Nothing much to read into that slip. Yeah, it yeah. seemed to happen when she was switching stances. I hear Kudai, Coach Kudar shouting combos, combos, but I think the whole fight, all we've seen is combos. Maybe it's time to look for those big teeps and big punches. Great straight right hand from Vernet Prinsloo. Yeah, definitely seems to be catching Sarah as she's coming in, trying to close that distance. It's not a big reach advantage, but just the way that they, they maintain, you know, the space between them uh, seems to be favoring Vernet. She likes to take a little step back as Sarah's coming in, and Sarah's throwing her strike and, and stopping in front of her. Succession uh, of right hands coming in from the red cornered Vernet Prinsloo. She's looking on to pile on the pressure. Last 55 seconds remaining of round number three. Yeah, definitely getting frustrated by those shots coming in. Even though those shots shaking her head earlier, they, they don't hurt. But I think in succession, taking multiple of them is definitely doing a little damage. If you've just tuned in, Vene Princely walked into the ring with those bruises on her leg. She's obviously had a hard fight camp coming into this. Of I'm not saying that Sarah Fish hasn't. Three ladies fighting out of the camp fight camp. Because you're putting in the work, you see them on Instagram, egging each other on. It's great to see. Fantastic training partners you can have, especially yeah, for, for sure. women. It's not as though it's a case of the women jumping in and training with the guys and sparring with the guys. You've got to have women to spar with as well. Yeah, especially guys who are on a higher level than you. You know, we, we see that this is uh, um her debut fight. But what we've seen from her, she looks like a slick. She knows what she's doing in there. Lifts her hands. The body language tells you I think she thinks that she's got it. I tend to agree, but we'll see what the judges have to say about that. Big hugs in the corner. Coach Vidal puts his fight up in there. Good work from Sarah Fish as well. Good technique. 
lots of defensive work as well. I think maybe just at the, in that last round, got a little bit tired and maybe started eating a few big shots. Um, but definitely recognized that she needed to put the pressure on and that's why she would have been walking into a few shots. Fighters greet in the opposite corners there, Just giving their respect to the coaches, uh, cornermen, and of course the fighters themselves are paying respect to each other. So here we see it's just a, a volley of punches from from Renee as Sarah was coming forward. She just piles on the pressure, landing shot after shot. We go now to the center. Referee Noranda Din has the fighters ready to call the victor. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of action, we go to the judges' scorecards, declaring your winner by way of unanimous decision victory and fighting out of camp fight in the red corner, Vernay Prince. Great effort there. Hugs all around again. Good work from the camp fight team. I'm sure they'll be hoping that that pans out for the rest of their fighters as well tonight. We also have Luke Turner up next fighting out of camp fight. So that's obviously why they have a lot of support from the crowd here tonight. Coach Padar and Sarah Fish taking some pictures there. Of course, it's always disappointing losing a debut, but I think they can take a, good, a lot of positive out of that fight. Good technique, maybe learn a little bit about that, uh, firstly, just keeping that distance. And then, you know, working on maybe counter-striking and not being the aggressor every, every time. Ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, three by two minute rounds, amateur rules in application in the super middleweight division. Introducing to you first, he'll be fighting out of the blue corner with the blue trunk swaying in at 73.5 kilograms and standing 1.83 meters tall. With a record of no wins against a single loss and fighting out of Iron Tiger, Cape Town by way of Tripoli, Libya. Making his second appearance at Ty Hollick's Fight Promotions, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ahmed Mito Al Khariani. His opponent will be fighting out of the red corner with the red trunks swaying in at 75.8 kilograms, standing 1.84 meters tall, and the record of one win and no losses, and fighting out a camp fight in Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Luke 
Some faces here, some of them familiar to us, some of them less so. But another camp fight fighter in Lou Turner. They must have had a big camp this fighter up this way around with four guys fighting out of their gym tonight. Yeah, there was no MMA being focused upon for the last couple of weeks, I can promise you that. Luke Turner up against Ahmed El Khariani from Libya. Of course, the Libyan, he uh, found himself in Cape Town following his dreams, trying to be a model. Of course, his uh, name on his shirt being Pretty Boy, he's here. And he's deciding that a black eye looks better than a perfectly straight nose, and that's why he's a fighter. So he joined up at Iron Tiger, absolutely loved the vibe, loved the people there, and got involved in the sport. Um, and, of course, he got taken under the wing of Lamin Suya, who also trains out of Iron Tiger, one of the pros that has fought at TFB. So he's got a lot of experience to fall under. Obviously, Nido Gomba is at that gym. So both these gyms being featured in this particular fight, both of these guys would have either had a very hard or a very horrible training camp because of the absolute demons that they've been sparring, learning to get you. Yeah, sure, and it's an old moniker, you know. Train hard, fight easy, although there's no such thing as an easy fight, which we've seen tonight. The guys are putting in the hard work uh, at their gyms and also putting on a good show. Ahmed w was walking past the gym on his way to school and just saw the sign, went in to go train, and next thing you know, he's on our card. He fought up against uh, Richard Hazelden, I think it was in TFP2. And what a great fight that was. He's got quite a lot of styling. Luke Turner, I love the way that he found his gym. He's actually a medic. So he was working an event at Camp Fight uh, as a medic for a fight night and decided, well, let me throw myself in there and see what I can do. does have a background in karate, trained in karate since he was seven years old. So we might see a little bit of that styling coming out. But yeah, obviously with Coach Dave there, uh, We'll have put on a little bit of tweaks and turned him into a Muay Thai fighter. We'll see how it goes now. Of course, those who train Kyokushin Karate usually highly accurate in their output, as opposed to Muay Thai, which is more like blunt force trauma. It's bludgeon. It keeps hitting the same spot if you can zero in, whereas karate is very specific. It's very pinpoint. And uh, accuracy is of the highest order. So, you know, can you blend the two styles successfully and be able to have some kind of an identity where you can spot, okay, this guy's a karate guy fighting Muay Thai, or is it eventually it just gets absolutely mixed in with the broth and all you get is a Muay Thai fighter? I think it's different for every fighter, but if you look at guys maybe like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who comes from a Taekwondo and karate background, but he also has like the ability to swing in those kicks the way that Muay Thai does with a baseball bat. So yeah, it's different for everyone, but... Um it's up to the coach as well to try and tweak those things out, but also if it's something that works for you, to put it to your advantage, you know, if you're using front kicks and, you know, just quick jabs, that's something that you can use in Muay Thai too. What I loved about the beginning of this fight is that there was no gap <laughs> offered. They stood in front of each other and banged away, and it seems like we're going to have an absolutely pulsating fight coming down the stretch. Both of these guys are testing the ab work. Who's done their sit-ups? Yeah, I wasn't sure if Luke was actually uh, putting his hand out there to, to maybe touch gloves, but <laughs> when, the, when it wasn't received, he just put it forward and actually landed a jab, side of the bat. But these guys are swinging at it, going hard. They're getting in the clinch. They're putting in the knees. Slip from a jumping kick there. I can promise you, when you land on your backside that hard, this is not a sprung ring, this is not wrestling. You feel every single bit of that. Yeah, for sure. But I think the adrenaline, you're so intent on, on your opponent. I'm loving the styling and the clinch that they're actually using their elbows. And that tells you something about what they're learning in the gym, right? Uh, knee to the groin there. Yeah, El Khariani is going to feel the backside tomorrow from that fall in the groin right now. What's the rule? Five minutes if you want to take it? <coughs> 
Yeah, you've got five minutes for the referee to give you that time to recover. Most guys usually, you know, will jump around, try and get it, get it out of the system and, and try and jump back in. The weird thing is when you're in there, the 30 seconds feels like you've been standing there for five minutes. So you just want to get on with the show. Meanwhile, you actually have a lot more time on your hands. But the guys just want to get back in it. Sometimes you see a, a bit of aggression coming out of, after that. Sometimes the guys just take a little bit light they realize it was a mistake. Back to the action, round number one, 44 seconds remaining. El Khariani up against Luke Turner. El Khariani in the blue trunks, Turner in the red. I think he got him again there. Wasn't too sure if Al Khariani was busy spinning around or moving around there that he caught him. But he maybe just needs to lift his kicks a little bit and bend his knee just so that it doesn't go from the foot specific that he's actually pointing the shin towards the opponent. Small oh, El Khariani, details. he's not right at the moment. He's grimacing away as we go back to the action in round number one. Yeah, definitely not happy. Good elbow over the top from Luke Turner. I see Luke's also got those, those stabbing front kicks and a big right hand that he keeps putting on, on the side of Al Khariani's face. Frustrating him. A little bit of power coming into the fight. Landing, landing, landing. I think Al Khariani goes. needs to be careful there to keep his hands up. Catching the, in the sweep, half the trip, but still counts as a legal sweep. All right. First round in the bag. I'd say a lot more pressure coming from Luke there. Akhriani looks maybe a little bit shell shocked, and that could also be to do with the fact that he's, you know, had two shots to the groin. Still, you can see on his face grimacing, not very happy with the way things are going at the moment. So, from a fight perspective, round number one in the can, who is going to be happier in terms of looking at the judges' scorecards right now, would you say? This is a, a, what makes it a little bit tough in the Muay Thai. Like, you know, it depends what the judges are looking at. I think Luke was landing a lot more clean strikes from the outside, but if you had to look at the clinch work, Al Khadiani was doing some good work there, getting some good knees in, elbows over the top. He even did a little bit of a Sanchai, jumping on top of his opponent and coming down with the elbows. There we see the clinch work, what I was talking about. You know, so it depends what the, what the judges are looking at. Everyone's looking at different things. They see things from different angles. Sometimes you don't see landed shots. Uh, when, the, when the fighter's body is in your way. And you see what I meant there was that Al Khariyani is doing, spinning around when he misses a shot, and that's the second time that he got caught in the groin was from, you know, trying to evade, but, but then catching a shot from Luke. The crowd is in store for a cracker. Round number two about to get underway, and they are making their presences felt. Wonderful crowd here at Grand West Casino and Entertainment World. Cape Town is where we are at here before full swing as the bell goes for round number two. Yeah, I think Al Khariani maybe is a lot more used to using his reach and Luke seems to be putting on a lot of pressure and sort of closing it down to him and it's, it's unsettling him. So we'll see if he's able to, to rally from that. But at least when he does get into a clinch position, he's, he's using the opportunity to score. Al Khariani is now using that right leg of his effectively. He's finding the gap underneath the elbow. Again, he lands it with precision to the ribcage of Luke Turner. I like it when Al Khariyan is moving backwards, he's actually landing shots on a defensive. It's not easy for fighters to do early on in their career to fight with the back foot. But when you've got someone that's pressuring you, it's, it's important to know how to do that. So, you know, the, the sooner the guys learn that they can strike off the back foot, you know, when, if you see, if you watch Luke, he's, he's constantly coming forward. But that's fine, that's his style. Um, it's more for Al Khariyani on the defensive, but to also be able to attack at the same time and not only come forward. Al Khariyani definitely more successful when it's open and at distance. He seems to be yeah. a guy who likes to operate with a bit of daylight between the two. I'm not saying that his inside game is bad. All I'm saying is that he's got more space to operate that right leg. Yeah, fighters all featured differently. It depends on like you know the type of pressure that they're receiving. A lot of the guys are used to maybe being the aggressor. So as soon as they're in a situation where their opponent's the aggressor, it puts them off their game. But as I said, when he does move backward and, and realize that he can strike off the back foot, he's not doing too badly. Getting caught up against the ropes there by Luke, landing some big shots. I think in terms of ring dominance, if I was judging this, I would, you know, be looking at Luke who keeps coming forward, landing shots, and they're pretty big ones. They're rocking Al Khariyani's head back. Um, we're also looking at effective striking, right? So, like, we're looking at breaking posture, uh, big strikes landing. He's turning away there, which means that, you know, he's not... <laughs> I'd like, to, I'd like to see, I'd like to see maybe John jumping in on this turn and maybe telling him to turn and not to turn around so much. But at the same time, we're seeing these massive welts on, on Luke's body. 
So it means he's also eating shots. Big kicks coming from Al Khaliani as he's moving backwards. Great round number two. Possibly one of the best rounds so far that we've seen tonight in the action of TFP4. Both these fighters are going to be feeling it, you know, at least temperature-wise, it's not too bad in here. It's not exactly a smokehouse in Bangkok. We've got air conditioning, but, you know, those guys are going to be absolutely pouring. But looking at Al-Khariyana, he looks pretty dry. It seems to be Luke Turner, the guy who is breathing heavier at this juncture of the break. Yeah, and often that's got to do with who's putting on the pressure. You know, a lot of the times when you're moving backwards, you're actually able to save a lot of that energy. Um, it's a little bit more of a balance effect, but when you're coming forward, you're loading those shots, you're putting the power on, and that's quite draining on the muscles, especially in the shoulders. So look to see what Luke does with his hands now. If his hands are maybe going to be dropping a bit, it could be a chance for Al-Khariyani to slide in some of those kicks, maybe go a little bit high, use the elbows. But I mean, Luke's doing a great job here. He's putting Al-Khariyani on the back foot, and that's unsettling him and really turning the fight in his favor, I'd say. Here we go, round number three, Al Khariani up against Turner. It's been a fantastic contest so far. Round number one was more of a feeler. Round number two, a lot more aggressive. What are we going to get in round number three? Again, That's big shots coming in. Almost putting Al Khariani over the ropes here against the ropes here. He almost came into our commentary box. Luke doing well in the clinch as well to find those knees. Al Khariani more focused on the elbows. But when the arms are up, it's difficult to land those elbows, right? So you're only looking for clear spaces. You should be trying to throw those knees at the same time. Also, it helps to stop your opponent from coming and putting pressure on you. The welt marks appearing thick and fast on Luke Turner's back. He's been hitting the ribs quite a few times by the right leg of Al Khariani in the second round specifically. But he comes forward throwing bombs over the top with that right hand specifically and then lands it again. And again, this is where we have that Moy Mud styling, just throwing the punches, walking forward. It's a, it's a style that you often see in Thailand, you know, everyone knows that they're famous for their kicks, but you have a lot of guys with the powerful punches because they don't work the same sort of defense. They expect the kicks to come, but the punches are something that you can land. It's a completely different style. And it's, it's definitely got to do with putting on the pressure and often favored by shorter fighters who are looking for those big overhands and coming forward while they fight. Yeah, both of these fighters are wearing 10 ounce gloves. The punches seem to be a lot labored. Okay, it's round number three. It's been sure. a taxing fight. There's not as much snap on those punches, but 10 ounces you're going to feel no matter how hard you get hit. Yeah, especially if, oh, there we have a big shot coming from Al Khadiyan with the front kick, but he's also taking a lot of big punches. You can see how his head's actually rocking from each shot. He's finding a few nice uppercuts there in, be in between, but I think he's taken a lot of damage in this fight, actually. And I feel like Al Khadiyan's legs wobbled a little bit there more. So from the damage he took then, the fatigue he's feeling. Yeah, last 10 seconds of the fight. Time to go for broke. Luke Turner is throwing that big overhand. He's been having success with that. Finding his target. The guys go right to the ball. A little stare down and a wink there. Big hug. Hands in the air. Good to see from the guys, you know. There's a lot of aggression. <laughs> that can be going into these fights, but a lot of it, this is sport, guys. Like, we like to come into the ring and throw as hard as we can, but at the end of the day, it's all about respect. It's all about having fun out there, you know, being polite <laughs> once, you, once the ball goes. Showing respect there, Luke binds the crowd, binds his fans. Big smile on his face, very happy. Al Khariani also with his hand raised. I think he did a good job on the back foot. But I think if I was uh, judging this, I would be, you know, favoring Luke with the forward pressure and lots of strikes landed. Again, a, a nice learning curve for Khariani. We'll see again what the judges say here. They're hugging the middle. You guys can't see that on screen. But there's, yeah, there's a lot of love here. <laughs> Especially after throwing like this heavy leather. I would have liked to see maybe a little bit more elbows on the forward there. But great work from both guys, especially considering this was Luke's debut and Al Khariyani's only second fight. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give both these fighters a big round of applause. Bell to bell action is what we saw and we go to the judges' scorecards. After three rounds of amateur Muay Thai action, your winner coming by way of unanimous decision victory. Fighting out of the red corner, Luke Turner. Good work, everyone.
Luke's in on his debut. Third fighter winning their debut tonight. Of course, most of these guys in the amateur section of the card making their debuts tonight. Great to see the guys being given a platform, the ability to showcase their talents here. All the hard work they're putting in in the gym. And this is what we like to see. You know, it's great to have a platform for the pros and the prime guys to, to shine. But this is where it starts. It gets the guys coming out, putting on performances like this. Showing good technique right from, from the outset. And they can only get better, right? It's just a little bit of work for them to do. Grow in the sport, get more exposure, more fights under their belts. And maybe make their way up to the platforms where they on the main card. Pressure from Big Turner. He's putting Al Karyani's back up against the, the ring, against the ropes. I think that's where Al Karyani maybe did his best was stepping off the back foot and throwing his switch kick as Luke was coming in. I think a lot of the times maybe he got caught up in, in the brawl and that's where we ended up in these clinches and then maybe took some shots to the body where he could have been a bit more effective on the outside. One more fight on the undercard this evening before we go into interval. This time, again, under amateur rules. Three by two minute rounds with a one minute rest. Ladies and gentlemen, the final bout of amateur rules to go on the undercard is about to get underway. Three by two minute rounds in the super welterweight division. Introducing to you first, he'll be fighting out of the blue corner, weighing in at 68.95 kilograms, standing 1.75 meters tall and wearing the blue trunks. With a record of no wins against single loss, he fights out of Iron Tiger in Cape Town, making his second appearance at Tyholic's Fight Promotions. Here is Dean And his opponent taking this fight on just a few days' notice. Standing 1.74 meters tall, weighing in at 68.9 kilograms, fighting out of the red corner and wearing the red trunks. With a record of a single win and a single loss, he fights out of Bushido MMA in Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yasser Jappi.
Alright, Dean Crobley in the blue trunks. Going up against a short notice opponent, Yasser Yapi. 22 years old. Has a uh, background in fighting though. Trained in an MMA gym. Competed in Jiu-Jitsu and lost, actually this year he made the Western Cape MMA team in the lightweight division. So does have some experience in the ring or in the cage. Yeah, fighting out of Bushido MMA. Not a lot of fighters that they have uh, supplied to Tarholics Fight Promotions. I think they're kind of getting into it. You know, the more events that we have, the more Bushido family we're going to be able to welcome onto your screens. Dean Krobler, no stranger. He's been here before. He was at TFP3 Continental Collision. He finds himself back in the ring. Short turnaround. Obviously, he didn't take too much damage in that fight. It was three, uh, TFP2 that he was in. Just being corrected by Paul Bergman. You know, you're allowed to say it. You don't have to just point at me and smile. Yeah, I didn't want to break your flow. But obviously, I did. Yeah, Dean uh, had an amateur fight there as well. Yeah, TFB2. Lost that one, but hoping to make up ground here. Yeah, this is the last fight on the undercard amateur rules in application. Three by two minute rounds. The weight division, Super Welter. Slightly under the super middleweight division of the fight that we saw just now. And uh, records, you know, 0 and 1 versus 1 and 1. Jappy with a 1 and 1 record, 0 and 1 for Dean Krobler. Both of these guys are going to be wanting to stick another W on the list. You know, a guy like Yasser Jappy is going to come here and he's going to want to stamp his authority and make it known that he's ready to take part in more TFP contests. What an opportunity he gets on a few days' notice. For sure. I think also a lot of the time, you know, people look at your amateur record and they look at the losses on there and think, hey, this guy's not maybe doing too well. But a lot of the time, these guys are maybe taking on more experienced fighters. Um, those losses don't necessarily count in terms of, you know, like how well you performed. They just show that you lost the fight. But I mean, there's a lot of experience that you gain from being in front of crowds, being in the ring, fighting opponents that are better than you only makes you better. So having that loss against your record, especially at, at, a, at an amateur uh, level shouldn't be something that deters these guys from carrying on with the sport. Not in at fact, all. In fact, it's something that'll that'll maybe bolster their fights and get them even better, having those losses on their record. You know, even the top guys in the world, you're getting from Thailand, 200 odd, 300 odd, 400 odd fight, but a whole bunch of losses picked yeah. up along the way. But that's why they're the top guys. Yeah, exactly. You've learned way more losing that fight than you have bludgeoning somebody and winning easily. For sure. It looks nice to have that shiny record, but the experience comes from both sides. You, you always hear that saying that you learn more from the losses than you do from the wins. And we'll see if these guys have learned from their previous losses. Round number one, here we go. Dean Krobler looking to open the action as the aggressor. Nice quick counter there from, from Yasser. He needs to maybe keep his hands up and watch out for those, those forward pressure strikes coming from Dean. Yasser Jappi looking very relaxed. He's not panicking. He's taking what he's getting given. But he's also got a very much of a poker player's face that he's wearing right now. Right place to be wearing it. We're at a casino. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think he's been, he's been involved in the sport for a while. He's been in other competitions. Maybe not in, in Muay Thai necessarily, but he's, he's experienced in terms of, you know, like ring, ring experience and, and fight experience. Just in terms of looking at the style of face value, Dean Krobler, the much more busier in terms of, oh, I'd say almost unnecessary movement. He's a bouncy, frenetic kind of guy. Yasser Jappi, a lot more composed. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, Yasser just needs to be careful that he doesn't get too, too relaxed, too sloppy. A good catch there and a good sweep from him. Well timed. I think that also maybe puts uh, Dean into a bit of a shell shock position there. He's not coming forward as much as he was earlier. Maybe he's eating a few big shots. You can see the waltz on his ribs there. But he maybe needs to, to think about taking advantage of the fact that his opponent's dropping his hands, um, maybe getting a little bit lazy with, with, what it, with his defense work. But again, he's staying out of range, so a lot of these shots that, that Dean's throwing aren't landing. We had a good combination there. Big left, big low kick. Eats a shot himself. That one put him on a little bit of wobbly legs. Good return by Dean Krobler going over the top. A bit of a question mark kick. Welt marks appearing. Dean Krobler's ribs telling a bit of a story. 
Yeah, good good work from both guys. I think Yasser maybe being a little bit more composed, uh, landed a few big shots there. I think that rattled Dean a little bit. But he's got a minute now just to recover, see what he can do when he gets back in for the second round. See Shaheen Price giving him some advice there in the corner, taking it all in. Yeah, so staying nice and composed. Coaches don't seem to have too much to say. Shane Deacon checking on his gloves there, checking the elbow pads, pulling them up over the arms, because sometimes that happens, his elbow pads are loose. So you have the, the situation where the referee needs to keep an eye on that, make sure that we don't have any elbows exposed. Um, sometimes the guys can take advantage of that uh, and throw, but you know, sharp eyes there from Shane, checking that the, the pads have slid down a bit and bringing it back up. He's gonna hate that I'm about to say this, but I don't care. Shane, Gucci Mane, freaking Deacon, the champion who is in the ring as the referee. Trying Shane Sweepin' Deacon. Sweepin' Deacon. I'm trying sweeping to get some real elbows up the momentum <laughs> on his nickname. He doesn't like <laughs> nicknames. So I'm trying yeah. to give him one. And everyone seems to try, oh, a big catch and sweep there. Everyone seems to be giving Shane, and he just sort of denies. But maybe one day we'll just have him find one. Pulling up the shin pad there. A lot more uh, forward momentum and intensity from Yasser this round. Maybe something, some advice he got from his corner there because Dean was looking a little bit rattled on those big shots to put that pressure on. But still, still bouncy on his feet, moving out of the way of the attacks. He's got a beautiful piercing front kick which he throws with both feet, Yasser Jappy. Yeah, and he's just countering good catches. I mean, that rattles the fighter as well. When you're throwing something and you're hoping for it to land and it gets caught, it really throws you off your game. And he seems to be catching most of uh, Dean's kick kicks and tips. But you know, he's also getting back everything that he gets hit with. He's getting his pound of flesh. He makes sure that he's responding on every shot that is thrown by Dean Cobbler. Yeah, for sure. I see Dean uh, shook his head there a little bit. I'm not sure if that was maybe a bit of a sight issue. Maybe he got the glove in the eye, but um, seems to be slightly better recovered now. But the wilds definitely growing up on the side of his body there. You can even see a little bit on his face. He's taken a few big punches. Seems to be wiping his eye, like maybe he can't see so well out of the left eye. But he's wobbled in here, and he's got him, he's got him rattled. He's got to put the pressure on. He's finding that hand. The referee jumps in to break it. Shane Deacon about to give the first standing eight count of the night. Well done by Dean, Dean Kobala. Very much against the run of play. I wasn't For expecting sure. that to happen. He caught him clean, and that's what happens. You know, you just can't take your eyes off your opponent, and you can't think, and his legs are not right. He's going to be in trouble. He nodded yes to the referee that he's okay to continue, but you can see his hands are down. He knew this from the first round as well. By getting that standing eight count, Deacon, uh, Dean the has, he seems to have taken a groin shot himself now in the last final 10 seconds of this fight. Clock stopped on three seconds to go. Only really benefiting Yasser Jappi because he's on one on spaghetti legs and now he gets to take a breather. For sure, he's taking big breaths in the corner there. I think that was a little bit unexpected for him that he, you know, he found himself wobbling. But props to him for, for hanging in there and uh, you know, nodding even though he was a little bit wobbly on his feet. He nodded to the referee to say, yes, I want to be in this fight. I want to continue. Good work from Dean there to handle that pressure, the opening segment of that round. As we see, Yasser actually stumbled into his container there. Of course, with all the gyms here, big contingent supporting both of these fighters. Iron Tiger, they're building an army. They're all here. They're packed in one section behind us in commentary here. So you're going to hear a lot of screaming whenever there's their fighters coming out. As we go to the replays from a very, very productive round against the run of play, comeback, if you will, Dean Krobler taking it to yeah, Jasper so Jappy. So we saw in the first round, Jappy was really, really content, happy to, to stand back, sit in the pocket and look for the shots, but he came out firing in the second round. And uh, yeah, against the run of play, I think Dean caught him with a big right hand. And then he marked it home. He went in with another right hand that shook the head of Yasser Jappi. And then, of course, the nut shot at the end, which bought Jappi some time and yeah. uh, pretty much saved him from what could have been a stoppage on the cards. Still looks a little bit like wobbly in the legs. He's going to be, you know, you can see he's on the back foot. His chin's high in the air, though. It's obviously why Dean caught him with that. He needs to be careful. Krobler took a shot to the knee. He was fighting inspired until that very moment. I think we, are, we are set for a great third round here. Both guys coming out firing. Big shots. 
not backing down an inch. This is an absolute war that it's turning into in round number three. And that's the thing, if you go train anywhere in Thailand, the first thing you learn is that you can't teach heart, and heart is one of the most important things in the Muay Thai fight. And both these guys have it in spades. Yes, they're putting the pressure on now, uh, landing big combinations. There's no flight, it's all fight here at TFB for full swing. Yasser Jappi with that laser right hand as he catches Dean Krobler in the corner. Let's just be careful not to gas himself out here, throwing those punches to his hands and eye and walking into a big shot. He needs to stay composed, make sure he puts the pressure on without getting wild. A minute remains just under. Both of, of these fighters really need a press at home now. Yeah, so with that uh, standing eight count in the second, I assume the judges would have given that a 10-8 round. If Yasso goes on to win this uh, third and final round, we're looking at maybe a draw and maybe a, uh, an extra round, if, if given that he might have won that first round. Whoa, ducks his head and almost eats a knee there. Both guys still giving it their all. Big shots, deep into the third, 20 seconds remaining. The fatigue on that back leg is setting in. Dean Krobler is not very steady on it, but he's trying his hardest and throwing that right hand. Good yeah. elbows from Dean Krobler. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, who's got some gas left in the tank if this does go to uh, a fourth round. Wow, look at those welts on the body. Guys bite to each other, hug in the middle. Great fight. So we'll wait to see if there's a, a fourth round now. Guys going and reaching the corners. Just having a look at what the, if any of the judges seem to be signaling that there might be. After this, we'll go into a break as well. 30 minute interval before we get ready for the main card of the evening. Opening up with the title fight. Pro Am SA belt on the line. The super lightweight belt between Zoe Clarkson from Camp Fight and Kristen Clark from Nakaim. All right, guys are getting some water. Looks like we might be going to another round, but we'll see what the judges have to say now. If we do, this is where the coaches should be telling them to take some big, deep breaths. It's obviously a little bit more than a minute. All right, while the judges deliberate, let's have a look at what happened in that third round. Big pressure from Yasser. Landing big clean strikes, walking in with the knee, landing it to the body. Still staying composed. Good work from him there. I think by this stage, Dean had, oh, nice elbow from him there, but I think he'd been sitting on that pressure as well, feeling that fatigue. Being given an indication that there shouldn't be an extra round, but we'll see what happens now. Fighters are still prep for it just in case it happens. All right. Referee Shane Deacon calls into the middle. Looks like we have a decision, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, after an all-out war, we go to the judges' scorecard, declaring your winner after three action-packed rounds by unanimous decision. He fights out of the blue corner. Big strike in the second round, obviously kind of in Dean's favor, getting him the win there. Maybe the first round was a little bit tighter than I was scoring it. Might have been a draw in that first round. Goes over to the corner to, to greet the guys. Third appreciation for them. Well done to both fighters putting on the work there. Good work there for mine, Tiger. Helping to set the tone for their fighters coming later. We still have Michael Poseidon out in the super lightweight division. He'll also be fighting for a Pro MSA title against Sipo Nelo and Tombela out of dominate, fight domination in Durban. And then the main event this evening, Mayro Gomba fighting out of Iron Tiger. Pro fight, the WMO International welterweight belt held currently by Pasquale Amoroso from Juvenzio Gym in Italy. As we take a look at the replays again, 
It'll be interesting to see those scorecards. I think the judges must have been counting strikes, looking at ring domination. Um, and also, you know, if the shots are landing, ooh, there's that big wobble we saw. There's a big right hand followed up. As they say, Yasu was doing the chicken dance there. But did well to stand his feet. I think most fighters in that situation might have taken a knee, gone down. He stood, stood there, said, no thanks, I'll keep trading. The referee Shane Deacon jumped in when he saw that the legs were a bit under wobbly under him. Great work there from Dean. Especially finding the target in a rush situation. I guess that's a lesson for Yasu to keep his hands up right from the start. Ladies and gentlemen in attendance, we now go to a 30 minute interval. Returning after that 30 minute interval, it's gonna be two title fights. Zoe Klaassen up against Kristen Clark. Sibonello and Tabella versus Michael Klaassen. Devin Ray Kos up against Anisha Maiman. Rafael Wozniak up against Matthew Murray. Pedro Kasoma up against Martin Avery. And of course, our main event of the evening for the WMO International Welterweight Championship. Five rounds of action. Pasquale Amoroso of Italy up against Nido Gomba. We'll see you in 30 minutes.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's action. Coming at you live from the Grand West Casino and Entertainment World in Cape Town, South Africa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In case you've just tuned in or joined us live, you're back with Tyholics Fight Promotions TFP4 Full Swing. All bouts are sanctioned by the South African Muay Thai Organization as well as the World's Muay Thai Organization. Coming up next, back-to-back -back WMO South African Championships are on the line. The best in professional Muay Thai fighting as well as our main event, an absolute barn burner. Pasquale Amoroso has come to South Africa to defend his WMO Welterweight International Championship up against South Africa and Iron Tigers, Ned Gomba. But without further ado, let's get stuck into the action on the card. As I mentioned, this is a title belt and it's women's Muay Thai. Three rounds of two minutes for the WMO South African Super Lightweight Championship. Introducing to you first, she'll be fighting out of the blue corner. With the trunk colors of all blue, weighing in at 62.45 kilograms, she stands 1.65 meters tall. With a record of three wins against a single loss and fighting out of Nakeng, Cape Town, presenting the second of our two male on title contenders. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kristen Clark. And now introducing her opponent, fighting out of the red corner with the trunk colors of red. She weighed in at 62.9 kilograms, 
Standing 1.7 meters tall, with a perfect record of five wins and no losses. She fights out of camp fight in Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Zoe Clausen. Right, we're live, we're back. Zoe Clausen stamping in her opponent's corner. Something I like to do myself, get in there, put some little bit of a bad omen uh, into your opponent's corner. We've got Kristen Clark fighting out of Nakaeng in the Balville and Durnville area versus Zoe Clausen, can fight in the table view area. Both girls determined to put on a good show here. Let's see what they're made of. Yeah, it's main card time down at TFP4 Full Swing. Thank you so much for tuning in on YouTube as well. Follow us on all of the socials. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so proud to give you the best of Muay Thai out of Cape Town and South Africa tonight. Grand West Casino and Entertainment World. Will that change somebody's luck in the fight lineup tonight? You know, this has got a belt on the line. It's a vacant belt. WMO is the sanctioning organization of the South African national title. Zoe Clarkson up against Kristen Clark. A lot has been said about this bout. A lot of people have been looking forward to it. They've done the press rounds. They've done the media tour. They've been on Expresso talking about their upcoming bout. And here these two ladies are about to face off. And it's for the gold. Yeah, they've both got some wins under their belts. Some impressive displays. I think uh, Zoe's got five wins to name with zero losses. Kristen turned 25 on Thursday, I think it was. Three wins, one loss to her name. Let's see who walks out of this on the victor. Kristen Clark, 24 years old, standing 1.65 meters tall with a reach of 60 centimeters. Fights out of Cape Town. She's a master's student during the day, so studying to pay the bills. But who knows? Maybe the world of Muay Thai is going to be paying her bills down the line. And uh, yeah, she's quite the athlete. Obviously the scholar, such as yourself, Carl Yeah, Bergman. for sure. She's studying at GWC. I think she's doing language proficiency and looking at impacts on social affairs. Uh, she's going to definitely be looking at a different kind of impact tonight, though. Zoe Clarkson, a bit younger, 19 years old, standing 1.7, so she's got a bit of the height advantage. Students as well. And fighting out of camp fight. Big crowd here in, especially the big fight atmosphere from the camp fight people. Yeah, Zoe looking to put her stamp on. She says she'd like to further her career and maybe even, you know, turn pro at some point to make a little bit of money off of what she does. Oh, if looks could kill, Zoe Clarkson just stared daggers at Kristen Clark on the turn there. So it's all set for an absolute cracker here. As we get underway with round number one coming up next, another five bouts, including this one down the stretch. Two championship bouts are going to be coming. This is the first of the two South African championship bouts. And of course, the main event the WMO International Welterweight Championship, the biggie of tonight with big action here at Tyholics Fight Promotions, TFP4, full swing. So this is a, a title fight, but still only three rounds and two minutes per round with a one-minute rest. 
Referee John Deblain in the middle, starting us off. And starting us off is a straight kick to the chest by Zoe Clarson. Yeah, Zoe Clarson comes out with a big tip, setting that range in motion. She's got to use that height. You know, she's got all the attributes here. She's got the height. She can keep Kristen Clark away. Kristen had a big shot there. You can see her adjusting her mouth. He's in her mouth. Zoe making sure she keeps it range. Big combinations coming out. Keeping Kirsten at bay with that teep. Nice going upstairs and downstairs, paying attention to all parts of the body. Yeah, I think if, if Kirsten wants to counter this, she's going to need to maybe look at catching those, those teeps. She's taking a very, a very slow approach to this first round. There are only three rounds, though, so she needs to pick it up straight from the, from the road go. But definitely a, a very Muay Thai style. I think she spent some time in Thailand. I'm not 100% on that, but I think she spent some time over there, trained a little bit. Sometimes that does influence your style. You know, you, you learn to, and the, even the way she wobbles her head, that's a very like, Thai thing, to get hit and just shake it off and play around a bit in the first round, pull the opponent out. But she's definitely got a lot of power. She's been, you know, in kickboxing world for a long time as well. So, yeah, we'd like to see what she can do here. She seems to have hydrated well, rehydrated well overnight, obviously. After the weigh-in, you're allowed to start eating those carbs again, the things that you've missed. For, not too much. No KFC just yet, but definitely Nando's. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Funny thing is I actually saw the guys from Team Angola slipping into KFC last night <laughs> before, <laughs> before I left Scandalous. Some listen, some don't, but Zoe Clark, she's putting in the good work here in the first round. She's definitely having the best of it, I'd say. So I'd say this is what Kristen needs to do if she wants to get a bit of an up, is to actually step in. Oh, throwing an elbow after the referee broke them. My apologies, Zoe Klaas and not Zoe Clark. It's Kristen Clark. As I get caught up with the names, I am only human. Kristen finishing off nicely there with a couple of stiff jabs. But I think, you know, with the way that she was keeping range, using the teeps, lots of big punches, I think... Zoe sort of outpointed Kristen in that round. See coaches David Dornbrack and Russell De Villiers in the corner here. Two very experienced fighters on the Muay Thai scene in, in Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah, Russell's been around ever since I can remember being involved in the Cape Town fight scene over a decade ago. It was always Russell with that pink, that shock of white hair that he used to bring to the ring. You fought him. Yeah, I fought him in my second pro bar at the K1 match. Russell, I think, was at the time maybe around 47, 48 years old. But <laughs> he threw those punches like he was in his 20s. Lots of power behind them. How did that fight go for the two of you? Um, it went to a TKO in the second round. I just put the pressure on, uh, got, got the call from the referee, counted out. And I think after the second count, uh, Russell said he wouldn't like to continue. Yeah, well, you're going to take the lessons from a coach who's been there and done it all, like Russell. David Dornbrack as well, very experienced in the mixed martial arts and Muay Thai world. Zoe Klaas and Kristen Clark, they square up for round number two. The crowd trying to lift their spirits here, lift the roof at the same time, get the girls amped, get them hyped for the second round. It's a big one for them. Got some gold on the line here. And away we go. The bell rings, round number two at TFP full swing. Zoe Clarkson, Kristen Clark, Zoe Clarkson in the red, Kristen Clark in the blue. You also notice with this being a pro am title fight, no shin guards. Elbow pads are in use though? Yeah, I, I think this might be the first time for both girls actually fighting out of the shin guards. Um, we're seeing a lot of big checks, but I, I think that makes you a little bit tentative as well to throw your own kicks. And yet, we are seeing that Zoe's throwing them, you know, with abandon. Good for her, good to get that out of the way and just, you know, land those big strikes. She's really utilizing her height advantage so well on setting up those teeps. Her timing is beautiful, and she's making Kristen Clark have to think again, and it could be panic station soon coming into round number three. We'll have to wait and see how that turns out, but it's a good strategy being adopted by Zoe Clarkson right now. Yeah, just staying on the outside, big, long jabs, lots of kicks, going down low, using the teep. Every time Kristen tries to come in, even if she's just standing still, we're getting that teep in the front, which you know, makes him not want to come forward. And she can't afford to be standing on the back foot and, and trying to fight from the outside because she doesn't have the reach, and you can yeah. see that now. Don't go to war if you can avoid it. You don't have to. You got the height, use that height. I mean, Carl, sure. you normally fight as the taller fighter, so you know exactly what this is all about. Yeah, and it's something, I mean, even though she's a taller fighter, she's still the aggressor here. We often, as taller fighters, work off the back foot as your opponent comes in because they're the ones trying to close the space. But she's got a lot of power behind her, so she's actually putting Kirsten on the back foot. 
Yeah, on the commentary tonight, Dev Curragh, as well as my good friend, music festival head. <laughs> We've had a couple of good times listening to rock and roll music in the middle of nowhere, haven't we? Carl Bergman, professional Muay Thai fighter himself. So adding all of the spice that you need to understand what's going on there right now, all the spice is coming from Zoe Clarkson. Seeing a little hematoma, a little bit of a welt on, on Kristen's head there from all these shots that she's taking. Beautiful Zoe, team. Zoe not, not taking as many, being very more reserved with her with her strikes. The face of concentration that she is wearing, it hasn't changed, it hasn't flinched, and she's just stuck at it. There's a clear game plan that she's sticking to, and she's not being brought into anything wild or exchange. Yeah, for sure. I thought maybe that Kristen would be putting a lot more pressure on, especially like there's simple things that you can do to avoid a tip, sweep it out the way, catch it, especially if it's coming in all the time. But I think it's actually catching her unawares, and she's not really prepared for that. So maybe, I don't know if Russell's telling her in the corner there, to put the pressure on, maybe look for those catches, bring in a bit of more technique, maybe some sweeps. Last round, she has to go for broke now. Yeah, and it's almost a case of her having to now take the risks to cut that distance, to get in close, to be on the chest of Zoe Clarkson, you know, not allow too much space to operate with that big leg, that big teep kick that she's being hit with. Is it possible for her to work her way back into this? Or are you saying at the moment, would you say it's comfortably two rounds in the can to Zoe Clarkson? I'd say, you know, yeah, Zoe's been doing really well just to, to outpoint her and just to keep her at bay. So we're looking for either maybe a 10-8 round or maybe a KO finish. Let's see what they can pull out here. But the way Zoe's looking at the moment, still looking pretty fresh, hands in the air, the crowd's behind her. It's up to Kirsten to make those adjustments and to come with some big power if she can. I know she had a knee operation last year. I wonder if that's maybe affecting her. You can see, I think it was the left leg and it's the one that's being taken a lot of kicks. So she may be a little bit ginger on, on that front one. You know, she's got to get stuck in. She really bit down on her mouth guard when I caught a glimpse of her face before the beginning of the round. Now let's see if she's going to follow through with that attitude. And that's a good way to do it as well. Keep your hands up, take the kick and follow, follow forward after that. You're not always going to be able to outstrike them, be the first one. Sometimes you need to take a shot and get in, especially if you're the shorter fighter and your opponent's using these long range and strikes. She needs to show a little bit more urgency. Good check there. Zoe Clarkson, only 19 years old, but fighting of the maturity of somebody many, many years beyond her age. Such an exciting prospect for South African Muay Thai coming up. Kristen Clark, 24 years old. She's still got a lot of mileage left on the clock. You know, we've got two very solid female contenders coming out of South Africa. We have to be very proud of that. Yeah, for sure. We can see Kristen busy switching up on the power there, bringing in some bigger kicks. A little bit of a better round, but she still can't really afford to be on the back foot the way she's fighting right now. And I can hear her corner shouting forward, forward, telling her to put on the pressure. That leg, the left leg of Kristen Clark has been chewed up. It's looking pretty red and blue right now. And again, she just eats a big kick to that thigh area. As I said, it as though she was listening to me, Zoe Clarkson. Oh, goes for the high kick. Goes with the hands up. There we go. She needs to do that more often. Just take that kick and walk forward. Last 25 so, seconds of the round. So important that you make sure you get revenge for every shot you take in the sport of Muay Thai. Definitely. And as far as the ties are concerned, if you're the one going forward, you can be eating shots. And a lot of the time, if you take one and throw one, they're going to score you because you're the one that went forward. It's been all Zoe Clarkson, calm, cool, collected, comfortable, and making use of her height the whole way through this fight. Yeah, I think she did exactly what she needed to do there. Keep her opponent at range. And just make sure that she did what she needed to do to go and win that fight. But we'll see what the judges say now. You can see the elation in the red corner. Zoe jumping on David Dornbrack. Kristen's body language looking a little bit down. Russell got her in his corner there. Paul Combole in the background there will be fighting on our next card, TFP5, the level up. Um, he will be fighting against Izzy Ibrahim for making his title defense for the super middleweight, I think it is. Both ladies getting a round of applause here for their efforts tonight. Crew Nicholas Radley, Samo co-president there with the belt. Super lightweight belt, 63.5 kgs. Pro-Am SA title.
Referee Jean-Dre Blaine calls the goals to the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, handing over the belt to the winner will be the co-president of the South African Muay Thai organization, Nicholas Radley, as we go to the judges' scorecards to declare your winner coming by way of unanimous decision victory. And new South African World Muay Thai organization super lightweight champion, fighting out of the red corner, Zoe Clark. Yeah, I think we could see that. Most people in the crowd could see that. The elation in the corner. The tie colors wrapped around her waist. South African gold for Zoe Clarkson from Camp Fight. You can see how much this means to her. Tears streaming down her face. Goes over to, to her supporters in the crowd. Well done. Some things there for Kristen to think about. Come back fighting strong. Got a great opener for us there. The first card, the first fight on the main card tonight. We have another pro -Am title up next. <laughs> you see Zoe took a little trip. Zoe took a little, a little tumble coming in, but she composed herself super serious other than, all, than that little smile she had just before the fight started. You can see the range that she had, using that tip to such great use, it's very effective, especially the, the fact that she's going to the body coming up to the face, mixing it up. So there we saw we actually, where Christian tried to catch the kick, but was pulled out again. I think what Christian needed to focus on there maybe a little bit more is looking at catching those kicks and maybe sweeping them aside. Um, definitely needed to count off that. The one thing that she did do all though was take those kicks up high. Uh, one of the come forward again, and as soon as she did that, you have Zoe on the back foot for half a second. Gives a little opening for her just to put a little bit of pressure. I think you can see in the body language there, maybe not as happy with herself as she could have been, but it's something to work on. Meanwhile, Zoe getting that strap wrapped around her waist. Through Nicholas Radley, congratulating her. As we have a quick look backstage, the guys warming up. Matthew Murray, you'll be taking on Rafael Wozniak tonight. In a catch rate fight, 68 kgs. I don't, I'm not sure if you guys have fought each other before, probably a long time coming. Both of them uh, former Western Province teammates, SA champs. There's Carlo, Skeppers, taking Matt on the pads there. Faraji Said in the background watching on. Ladies and gentlemen, the following bout is a rematch. However, this time there is gold on the line in the form of the WMO South African Super Lightweight Championship. Introducing to you first, you'll be fighting out of the blue corner with the blue trunks, weighing in at a clean and ready 62 kilograms even, and standing 1.71 meters tall. With a record of two wins and a single loss, and fighting out of Iron Tiger in Cape Town, he returns to TFP for his third appearance with revenge on his mind. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Besaidenhout.
This is a vacant title and here is the second of our two challengers. Fighting out of the red corner with the red trunks weighing in at 62.15 kilograms and standing 1.78 meters tall. A perfect record, three wins and no losses. He fights out of domination gym by way of Ulundi KwaZulu Natal, making his third appearance at Tyholic's fight promotion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sibonello and Tom Bella. Subdued music played to the entrance of Sibonello and Tombella. I've been looking forward to this bout. Now that there is a belt on the line, there's that much added pressure on both of these two fighters. Sibonello and Tombella, he's come here to defend his perfect record. He's 3-0. Of course, he was the victor the first time that these two fighters met. Michael Besaido, however, that particular fight, what stands out in my mind, marked a real step up in his ability and it was noticeable that night. So let's see, are we going to have a Michael Besaid note who steps up once again and is finally able to take the O away from Sibonello and Tombella? For sure. I remember how impressed we were with, with Michael in that fight. We, I think, <laughs> wrongly so, obviously, but we, we thought that maybe Sabu was going to have an, an upper hand on the, on the power and the size advantage and maybe just walk over Michael. But Michael really stepped up there, showed us he was game, wasn't afraid. He actually dropped away close to come down to 63. His first fight that he had at TFP was with Shane Deacon, I think that was at 69 kgs. So also, you know, working on the conditioning at Iron Tiger basically came out a completely different fighter. We were having a, a laugh last night between these two guys. This is only the fourth TFP, but between them we've had seven appearances. Michael uh, appearing in his fourth TFP and Sabu in his third. So these guys are, it's sort of like hometown advantage for them fighting here in the TFP ring. I made a joke with Michael, I said to him, if he gets to his 10th fight in a row, we'll give him a scratch card, and every time he just gets a free scratch and he works his way to a free belt. Well, here we are. The two of these fighters are going to be staring across from each other. You know, it's actually quite strange that you say, Michael Bissetno came down a division. Look at the size difference between these two guys. Yeah. I mean, both the Tombella brothers are absolutely jacked. The two of yeah. them, I don't think that they've ever, ever put on an ounce of spare fat or wait by looking at a loaf of bread, unlike myself. <laughs> and of course, unlike yourself, you know, we get older yeah, and that's things become harder. But these two young kids, they're here to prove their mettle at TFP4 full swing. Yeah, both super tough brothers fighting out of Domination Gym in KwaZulu Natal. Great to see Sabu back again. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what, what Michael's got up his sleeve. Software developer by trade, can he develop a method to beat and get the revenge that he needs over in Tombella? Michael Besaid notes, Sibonello and Tabella, they are called to the middle of the ring, and away we go. Three by three minute rounds, of course, at play here. Yeah, and as you said, that size difference, you know, so definitely noticeable in, in, as they square up there. I remember last time, what, what worked really well for Michael was that he sort of lasted that first round, you know. Sabu is a powerful guy, but, you know, if you can show you can weather that initial storm, there's a lot of work Michael actually putting the pressure on Yeah, Super interesting to see him coming forward, throwing those punches, working the head, working the body. Maybe that's something they, they spoke about at the gym, worked on the fact that, you know, Sabu's a tall guy, but there's, there's that entire long body for you to strike. Yeah, I think maybe a case of Ntombele remembering that first encounter, going, I can't blow the wad in the first round. For I've sure. got to respect this guy. Yeah, and that's also something that they'll learn as they go through these fights, you know. As they go through their amateur career, now making their, their pro-am debuts here or getting a chance to fight for the title at least. 
Interestingly, the Jitters seem to be on Ntombele's side. He's visited the canvas twice already. Of course, not fucking the point scoring, but he's being put down. Yeah, and I think that's also him working off that front foot. He's throwing a lot of those teeps to the face, and Michael sort of working forward, and that's putting him on the back foot and actually losing his balance. Beseda note, looking very calm, very composed. And, you know, having the, the upper hand in the strike so far, we've heard these cracks from, uh, from ringside here, yeah, and definitely Michael get, getting good shots in, landing multiple combinations. Sabu looking a little bit out of sorts. Maybe it's because he's, he's you know, containing himself, not wanting to, to blow himself out like he did in the last fight. And Tom Bella's coach crew, Clint Walters from Domination Gym, he fights out of Ulundi and KZN. Yeah, Shaheen Price is the hometown coach for Michael Besaid Note, Iron Tiger, located on Bree Street in Cape Town. Michael taking a big shot to the leg there. You see how it buckled him. That's something that maybe Ntombele should be working on, especially with the range. Hit that leg, keep yourself on the outside. No need to, to force it here. This one, we're having three rounds, but they're three minutes apiece, so a little bit longer. The guys have to work a little bit here. Good catch of the kick by Michael Besaid Note. Again, the catch of the kick and the strike to the leg. Yeah. And Tombella just stays up. Another catch. So, Good work from him, yeah. He's definitely recognizing that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity with catches. And he's not afraid. He's, he's coming forward, you know. He's putting in the big strikes. I love seeing that. Is the smaller this, guy doing what he, what he needs to do to get that win, yeah. Is this the product of the joys of training with Nido Gomba? Almost certainly. And, I mean, these guys are, oi, wobbled him there with the big elbow. Slipped himself there. I think Tombella actually... Got a little bit of a, a wobbly leg on that one from a big elbow under the pad. That certainly landed. I can't wait to see the highlights package of this round. This is a different Michael Besaida once Completely. again. It's great. It's great to see like that instant development, you know, from fight to fight. We're seeing him progress. We, we had a great uh, undercard with all the amateur fighters. And I mean, seeing the guys starting at that point, I'd just love to see what they're going to be doing coming out. Michael raises his hand. To the pause from the crowd, a great run from both guys, working really hard, but I think Michael edged it out there. And Tombella's got work to do, man. This is not the same fight that he had those months ago, and this is not so long ago that we're actually going to be honest with ourselves. So here we go. Michael Besaid note, the more comfortable fighter, and standing up. Yeah, electing not to take the seat. I guess that's a preference for, for every fighter. You can see he's working in there. When Sabu when counters, he's got his hands up, so those strikes aren't landing, but he's going in, Sabu's hands are low, he's finding the target, he's hitting the leg, he's catching the kicks, he's doing everything that he needs to do. And I'd say he had a, a near perfect round there. I don't think he took too much damage. See, he's got a little bit of a wealth in his face. That might have been from a big punch. But otherwise, yeah, yeah I think he did probably about a good 70 to 80% of the work was there from Michael. And I really just hope that we're going to get a capture of that elbow that came into the top of Ntombella's head, courtesy of Michael Besaid. Note, it definitely wobbled the legs of Ntombella. There, there it is. As he was coming forward, also maybe dipping his head around, so he was maybe you know trying to avoid... The punches that were coming, Michael come, stepping forward, throwing that elbow over the top, catching him unawares while he was in, in a bob and weave situation. It just shows you it's not just all about throwing those punches. If you stick an elbow in between, it breaks the rhythm of what you've been throwing and more importantly breaks the rhythm of what is being read by Ndombele. For he's sure. expecting shots to come Especially by the first. He's coming forward, he's, he's actually creating momentum for Michael to, with which he can put his elbow against. So he's actually he's doing, doing himself a disservice by chasing. He doesn't have to, he's actually the taller fighter. But I think because Michael's putting the pressure on, you tend to answer it with pressure from, your, from, your, from yourself. I have a feeling that this round is where the fight is going to be won and lost. Here comes the more aggressive Sibonello and Tombella. Yeah, he needs to make sure that he, when he's doing that, he needs to catch Michael. Michael's got a lot of good footwork. We're seeing a bit of switches. He's moving in and out. He steps forward on his kicks and then, oh, big oh, punch there as well. Beautiful left hook up to the top of the head. But so Michael Besaid, no. So he's doing well to, like, to, to take that and still stay composed. You know, we're not seeing him rush. But he doesn't, you shouldn't be chasing. You should be waiting for Michael to come in, set up those shots, and then land. And maybe, maybe check those kicks instead of moving away because you're bringing yourself out of striking distance and then throwing those wild shots like that. Certainly, he looks like he's throwing the shots at the wrong distance, the wrong marker, yeah. and he's missing. But Michael's doing really well. He's, uh, you, know, you see the, the lots of switches stepping in, fainting in, which is drawing the strikes from, from Cebu, and then making him miss. And that's frustrating, and, and that's why we're getting these wild shots. But maybe Cebu looking for a big shot. I know Michael ate one earlier, and, and he took it really well, so it'll be interesting to see what Cebu does now. But he's got to watch because Michael Besaidnot is dialed in catching those kicks from Cebu and Tumbela as Cebu lands a very stiff jab. And again, stiff jab right hand. Yeah. He's also opening up a little bit, maybe finding the target a little bit better in the, in the latter half of this round. 
again. Michael just needs to stay composed, keep those hands up like he did in the first round, and counter. This has become a closer fight now, thanks to the second round effort by Sibu and Zumbela. Yeah, definitely he's putting the pressure on this time. I think the first round he was actually sitting back a bit. Maybe his coach told him, you know, you need to go, go and put that pressure on. Uh, Michael taking a shot to the groin there. These guys fighting with eight ounce gloves, so a little bit smaller, hurts a little bit harder. As Michael Besedno tries to regain his composure after that shot south of the border, thanks to Sibonello and Tombella. Seems to be struggling here. And Tombella's getting a good rest out of this, whereas Michael Besedno, lungs are crouched over. Okay, standing up. Maybe maybe giving him a little bit more time, didn't look too comfortable there, but we get back to the action. minute left in this round. Michael needs to make sure that he, he avoids those big shots because I think that's what, what it was maybe going to be to boost. Oh, yeah, a great deep push kick there as Sibonello was coming in. Michael and playing with, with reckless abandon at the moment, but working well to, to move around and stay out of range. It's almost revenge for that nut shot. Yeah, that it feels like it. Caught and oh, swept. He did a good job to avoid the initial sweep, but uh, because his leg was up in the air, he's you know, already off balance and just threw him down to the ground. The sad note's got to be careful. It almost looks as though he's trying to still get the revenge, but he doesn't need to. I think he's exacted it. He's got to go back to the composure oh, that we saw spinning, in the first round. Spinning back fist there from Sabu. Michael, his awareness of what Sabu's throwing is really good. The only time it's really getting caught is when it's coming in. Okay, chip, no, that's just a, a chip, nothing. Good stiff right hand from Intombella. Wow, hard round to score. Yeah, I think Michael did really well to avoid most of the big shots Sabu was throwing, especially in the first half of that round, you know, doing really well to keep his head off the line and just, you know, bob and weave a little bit, not take too much damage. Um, I think maybe as Sabu started catching his rhythm a little bit better in towards the second half of the round, started catching Michael here and there, but I still think Michael actually outpointed him there. So you can see lots of fancy footwork from Michael, lots of little switches and, you know, bringing his, bringing his body forward and back again. He strikes, gets out of range. Sabu was being frustrated by that in the beginning part of the round. And maybe as, as Michael was fatiguing a bit, you start to see a slowing down. Big, big catch there and a big sweep. It might might uh, have swung the, the judges in that round. But Not inconceivable to say that it could be one round apiece right now. Could be. It's, it's very close to the second round. Oh my God! And man, if it is, it sets up for a cracker. Michael Besedno raising his hand to his fans over here. The Iron Tiger Army are in the house at right, Grand West behind, Casino. Getting behind their fighters. He looks pumped. He's ready to go. Spinella's already in the middle of the ring. <laughs> Michael gets called to the center. Here we go. Third and final round. Three minutes. The WMO South African Super Lightweight Championship gold is on the line. One round to decide it. Uh, yeah, Shaheen Price calling from the corner to set up to set up the kicks. Michael's throwing those low kicks and Sabu's going out the way. He's doing well though. Like Sabu's now putting the pressure on, so he can find that leg if he needs to. I think Besaidenhut has gone back to the first round. Besaidenhut. Oh, a huge sweep. That's going to count in his favor. Hugely. The crowd gets behind that. Dumped him on his shoulder. Oh, oh and return favor. But Sabu went down with him there. Knee touched the ground. So technically doesn't count as a, as a trip or a sweep. See, this is why we have Carl Bergman <laughs> in the box with me. Because I would never have known that that was the ruling. Yeah, as soon as both guys go to ground, you know, you can still end in a dominant position, so it does count in your favor, but it's not necessarily like the way we count the, the strikes, uh, the, the points in a strike and, a, and a, a clean sweep. Pulsating third round action here, one minute and 57 seconds remain. Michael doing well to keep chopping that leg. He's going inside, outside, hitting the body with his punches, hitting the, the head as well. Sibonello chasing him. He realizes he needs to put that pressure on. Land the big shot here. He's still looking, still hunting that head. Catches him every now and again. The side note remains elusive. As we enter the, the second half of this round now. Good Who inside big kick. Big swing, uppercut and a miss from, from Cebu. Big kick there from him, puts Michael off his feet. Good one, two to the body by Besaidnot. Evades the jab coming back from Intombella. 
Yeah, I'm loving the exchanges here. I think that Prajit on his arm may be <laughs> distracting him a little bit. Slipping down onto the elbow guard. I hope it but doesn't. He's doing, he's doing well just, just to try and ignore it. Michael's doing well as well. His movement, you know, getting around the ring. But Sabu with some big kicks. Michael, Michael eating some shots there. You can see a couple of welts building up on his face and on his body. Yeah, but still, completely keyed in. Really don't want the tassels whipping the eye of the opponent. That's going to be a horrible one to take, obviously. We haven't actually seen a lot of elbows, not even a lot of knees in this fight. It's mostly been Good big jab. punches, lots, lots of kicks, and a, and a few great sweeps in this in this fight. And in this round, Michael with that opening big one. We're not too sure what the judges would have seen if they had seen, you know, uh, Sabu's knee going to ground there. So they might have it one apiece on the sweeps. The strikes are pretty clean and even at the moment. 20 but, seconds remaining. Yeah, 20 seconds to put your stamp on this round, put your stamp on this fight. Nice tip to the leg there. Michael's still looking pretty good, bouncing around. Last 10 seconds, here we go. You see a wild flurry, boys. Wow, super interesting, great fight. The crowd, the people standing up on their feet behind me. Great fight from the guys. Super close one to call. We'll see what the judges thought about that. Both fighters put in some good work. I think Sabu was chasing a bit more. Michael did well to evade a lot of the strikes. Um, but again, you know, sometimes the judge might consider that forward pressure, landing your strikes and missing. You know, we're going to see what they were looking at now. As we take a look at the replay, yeah. This was at the start of the third round, a massive catching catching that kick and, and a big sweep. Steps through, grabs the leg, dumps him on his shoulder. Good work there from Michael Zadenote. Getting underneath his opponent's uh, body weight there. Big looking for the elbow, Sabu returns. Boom, goes to ground, his knee touches there. But I mean, you know, he ends up in a dominant position. The referees might see that. Oh, sorry, not the referees, the judges. There we go, dumps him on his back. I think if he had maybe just released him mid-air there, he would have like got that sweep clean. All right, the guys, you can see on their body language, I don't think either of them knows that they have this in the bag. We go to Devon for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start by giving both these fighters a massive round of applause. As I mentioned at the top, this is a rematch. Is it revenge or is it repeat? Ladies and gentlemen, we go to the judges' scorecards. Your winner coming by way of a unanimous decision victory and the new WMO South African Super Lightweight Champion, fighting out of Cape Town, Michael Poseidonho. on him. Well done to Michael Zeta note. In his elation, almost jumped over the ropes to Shaheen's arm. He's worked hard. Every TFB, this guy's been there, been putting in the work in the background. Started off his, his career with two losses. Comes back to show that he's got the grit, got the medal to do what he needs to do to get that win. Well done to Michael Zeta note. Cracker of a fight. We've got those two pro MSA titles out the way now. We're about to turn on to the, the pro divisions. These guys did a, did a great job here now. See, I think those those catches and, and you know, keeping keeping Zabu on the back foot by not letting him know what's coming next worked really well for Michael. He hit the body, he was hitting the legs, he was going up top for the, for the, the punches to the, to the face. Great job by Michael and the footwork as well. In and out. Landing his strikes, making sure that he, you know, he's switching his, his stances as he goes. Just keeps his opponent guessing. Sabu definitely, like, he knew that he had to get in there and try and close the distance because Michael was working back off the back foot. But I think he could have also maybe held his ground, let Michael come to him and throw those counter strikes. 
but I mean, still a great effort from him. Close fight. Had also had some good moments for him. Some big sweeps, big catches, lots of good punches, kicks. Good work from both guys. And I'm pretty sure we're going to see them again on another TFP card sometime soon. If you're watching this fight on YouTube live with us, don't forget to give our channel a like, click on the subscribe button, follow us on Facebook and Instagram to Holix Fight Promotions. Stay up to date with the latest cards, what's happening. We put our promo videos up there. Get interactive. Big sweep. Great work seeing some great Muay Thai skills on display. Backstage glimpse, Rafal Wozniak warming up with Shane Deacon. Crew Nicholas Radley overseeing things at the back there. Going to be a great fight. Got four pro fights on the card for you this evening. Rafal's third to last. He'll be taking on Matthew Maria, who we saw warming up earlier. You can see Crew Nick putting on the fine tuning just before the guy's about to step out. A little bit of work, little things to think about. Stuff they've obviously drilled in the gym. As soon as you key them in, walk out, these things start to become second nature. There we see Team Angola's Pedro Costoma. Ladies and gentlemen, the following bout to go distance of five by two minute rounds. Professional rules, women's Muay Thai to go out in the bantamweight division. Introducing to you first, she'll be fighting out of the blue corner. Standing 1.6 meters tall, weighing in at 52.5 kilograms and wearing the blue trunks. Making her debut with a combined fight record of five wins and two losses and fighting out of pride. Fighting Academy in Cape Town, Anisha Mayman. Now introducing the second of our two contestants here this evening, fighting out of the red corner and standing 1.55 meters tall, weighing in at 52.85 kilograms and wearing the red trunks. With a record of nine wins and two losses, fighting out a camp fight in Cape Town, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Devin Ray Ho!
I've watched the change in you. The words of Chino Marino of Deftones playing in. Devin Ray Ghost here into the professional Muay Thai world. Are we going to see a change in Devin Ray? And of course, it's Anisha Maiman making her professional debut. Of course, I mentioned she had a combined fight record that encapsulates all of her fighting experience. Devin Ray, hers is built in Muay Thai, which is why it is a little bit thicker. But both of these ladies, Pro Rules Muay Thai, it's their first time. Yeah, for sure. I think Devin, is she coming up uh, a division here to, to face Anisha? So it will be great to see all oh, the girls stomping in each other's corner and not backing down from the word go. They're about to give us a great show here. Yeah. I know Anisha Maiman very well. We train in the same gym and well regarded as the hardest worker in the room by everybody in that gym. Her output has been crazy. She's been putting in an insane camp, 5 a.m. starts to every day, fighters classes, doing all of the classes as well as the one-on-one -on -one tutelage from her coach Michael Manemini of Pride Fighting Academy. And once again, Devin Ray Khos, what is there to be said that we haven't already seen? She is the full package. She's good linearly. She comes in and out with a very stiff jab and a very good right hand. She does the fundamentals and the basics very well. And that, of course, a product of Camp Fight and David Dornbrack, her coach. For sure. Just going into this, this part, now that we're on the pro card, we're looking at five rounds for the, for the women division, only two minutes with a two minute rest, just in case we have any cuts. So you'll see no elbow pads, no shin guards, no head guards. This is getting about as raw as it gets now, these guys are going to have a crack at each other. Looks can be deceiving, the ages of these ladies, 39 years old for Anisha Maiman. Quite an advanced age to make your first stepping into professional fighting, never mind any sport at all. But I can promise you, it's not going to matter. She goes like a 20-year-old. For sure. She said, uh, it might sound cliche, but she said that she's looking to show that age is nothing but a number. If she can put the work in in the gym, get into the ring here and show that she's still got what it takes, why not? The theatrics involved in the Y crew, which sets the tone for the rest of the fight. Five rounds of two minutes about to get going. The ladies are going to bring the fire here at TFP for full swing. Devon adopting a bit of a John Wayne pass style there, stamping her foot as she releases a, an arrow from, from her quiver. John Wayne, of course, usually does it right in front of his opponents. You see some funny reactions. Sometimes the guy's dodging or catching the arrow and breaking it. I think Anisha just stood firm there. Might have just bounced off her shoulder. So here we go. Thirty-nine years, not twenty-nine, but hey, I'm gonna give it to her. <laughs> <laughs> she's taken ten years off in the gym just to come and, and show us what she's got in the ring, yeah. And here we go. Devin starts away. With, a, with a high kick, and needs to blasting out the gates. Full blast of the straight punches down the line. Devin puts her arm out, tries to gauge the distance here, keep her at bay. Something we haven't seen a lot in, in the fight so far is, is a long guard. Devon attempting to put her out. It's where you keep your arm in front of you, you defend your, your face with your back arm, usually the elbow across the face. Um, <laughs> it's usually used by, by the taller opponents against a, a shorter fighter, but yeah, we see Devon trying to employ it. Anisha not backing down, coming forward. Anisha Maiman with all the volume here, but she's got to watch out. You know, Devon Rejos is a champion. She knows how to go the extra distance and how to manage her time. Yeah, and with it being five rounds, I think you've seen often, even in, in the three rounds, the guys get pretty fatigued after that, those first two rounds, especially when they come out the gates the way Nisha has. But, I mean, she's looking game halfway through this round, still putting the pressure on. And if you've got as many tattoos, you got a thing for pain, so that's not going to be counting again. So she is ready for this fight, Devin Rejos. Taking pain, giving it out. Devin, of course, a tattoo artist, worked on me. Yeah. Oh, she give you that I love Devin Curra tattoo on your left <laughs> shoulder. It, it used to say Devin Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Good action here in round number one. The ladies are opening oh, up on each other. Devin looks for a leaping elbow there. He slides over the top of Anisha's shoulder. I think she felt the wind on her ear there. Anisha answered the plow with a flurry of punches and also looking for an elbow over the top. Calming down a little bit here in the, in the latter half of the round. Maiman needs to just keep it simple. One, two. Kick up, kick down, they don't need to be, because Devin Rejos is not hard to find. 
Yeah, and I think with Devon Shorts, maybe, yo, yeah, she's got her hands up, so she's avoiding a lot of those strikes, but also, like, those big shots to the body there. She's maybe just, uh, yeah, find her way in, work her own punches. I think she's staying a little bit static, staying on the outside. You can see the welts on the face, taking a lot of damage there. As if we need to tell you, as if you haven't seen it, the crowd lets you know that was a fantastic opening round between these two ladies. And dead silence, almost as though a mark of respect. Yeah, and we can hear Mike in the corner there telling Anisha a beautiful round, doing the work that she needs to do. I think when, when Devin walked up to, to Dave there, he said something about, like, don't worry about the strikes landing in your face. Like, you walk, walk through them and just keep going. Here comes a packed replay sequence. There we see right from the opening bowl, Anisha just landing those flows and landing every second or third shot, you know. Um, I think Devin was maybe looking to, to counter, but as soon as you open yourself up, she's got the range on her and she keeps landing those strikes. Now, what I've come to know about Anisha Mayman's style, regardless of whether it's boxing, kickboxing, or Muay Thai, she is a person who fights in spurts. She definitely opens up and throws volume and then calms down. But she's very explosive, and that little opening of volume can come at any time. Yeah, and that's something, uh, as an opponent, that will put you off. You know, you never know when it's going to come, so you're always uh, tentative, you're waiting for that, and that will put you off your rhythm. So I think for Devon, what she needs to do is maybe keep her hands up, walk in, Throw those short elbows that we were speaking about earlier, like, you know, as soon as Anisha's coming forward, put the pressure on in reverse. And the ice being applied to the knee and the shin area of Devon Rejos' right leg, Anisha Maiman. No ice, no face, no panic. She seems to be absolutely fine taking on the advice from Mike Manemini of Pride Fighting Academy. Yeah, it's also great that we have these corner cams. You can see what's going on in between rounds. Great for the audience back at home. At the same time, they're getting to see both corners. Which and the audience live here. There's two massive monitors that we have to watch. The yeah, it gives us a great see. idea as well of the body language and the type of information that they're busy, you know, downloading in between rounds. A little bit longer rest, the two minutes there. So, two minutes. Perfect for when your fighter is cut and bleeding because you need that extra minute to stop it from happening. Neither of these fighters Oi, opened up Devin just Watson yet. to a big stiff jab there from Anisha. Another one lands. Keeping it simple, the straight shots down the line. That's a good, one of the best ways to stop a boxer though. Look for those body shots as they're coming forward. Kick, kick the body. Good sweep there, get the, the teep out the way. Whoa, wild swing, spinning back. First. It's the second time that Devin Ray has tried to attempt something that is flying, that is spinning, and she's missed on both occasions. Yeah, interestingly there, she actually went over Anisha's head. You know, maybe, um, maybe aiming upwards, maybe she just slowed straight down the pipe and just see what happens there. Big knee to oh, the middle. As that big happens, team push. Devin Gets the campfire crowd on their feet. Both ladies' midsections are going to hurt tomorrow morning. This is the second of five rounds. Still high-paced action. Anisha still blasting from long range. Oh, elbows are going in close orders. Yeah, I think if Devon's in the step in, she shouldn't be looking for that looping elbow over the top. She needs to step in with a straight elbow, covering her face as well, so she doesn't catch the shots as she's coming in. Maiman throwing a good hook around the jab of Devon Ray Close. This round a little bit closer, a little bit better for Devon. Yeah, she's working from the outside. Slight reach and height advantage to Anisha Maiman, and she's making use of it. Whoa. Counter shots by Anisha Maiman. Close is having trouble judging the distance, the, the attack line of what Anisha Maiman is throwing back. Yeah, much bigger opponent than she's used to. I know that she fought Yolandi... Yeah, no, Yolandi... Something. Sorry, Yolandi, I forgot your surname there. Oh, how disrespectful anyway, of you. <laughs> she, fought, she has fought taller opponents before, but in this case, like, struggling to read that range. Anisha breathing a little bit harder. Yeah, Devon still looking quite composed. Yeah, comes some bigger breaths though. Two minutes to recover. So tell me, the thing about the arms up on the ropes, help you or does it take the blood away from your fists? What does it do? Well, I think it's maybe just a comfortable position first. She feels relaxed in that position. 
I also like to put my arms up on the rope. But I don't, wouldn't say there's any particular reason for it that I do it. You know, one would think that only the blood flow is going to trickle back down into your body at a slight downward angle. It can't really help your hands, but so be it. Amesh, mm. Anisha Maiman is uh, adopting that as her corner stance. Devin Ray again with the ice pack being put on this time the left leg and the left shin. Yeah, I think what Anisha is doing really well here is like doing, you know, everything coming in volleys. So she's throwing those hands and she's stepping in with the knee. That was a good tip there from Devin though. Also something for her to think about is when Anisha steps in with the punches, maybe get those kicks, get the teeps in. That's how you stop a boxer. Two rounds in the can, both ladies showing great conditioning, neither with their mouth open any particular more than just a smile. And um, they look comfortable, they look fine. Third round, this is where it begins to open up. Yeah, for sure. Often you just have those first two rounds as your, your feeling out process. <laughs> Not that they were, they, they came out the gates firing, but still, you know, feeling them out, finding your rhythm, seeing where you actually fit into this, this fight game now. Both of them adjusting to the opponent's reach. And we'll see how it goes in this third round as they start to maybe open up even more. Anisha Maiman in the blue, Devin Ray Host in the red, Pride Fighting Academy up against Camp Fight. Round number three at TFB4, full swing. Professional Muay Thai rules in application, women's bantamweight division. Oh, big inside kick there from Devon. What I find quite interesting about Devon though is that even though she's a southpaw, she keeps going to the left and actually giving Anisha that, you know, taking away from her power side by stepping, stepping out. You think she may be stepping to the right, throwing that, that left kick of hers more, uh, uh, less abandoned and just, you know, putting some power into it. Yeah, we've seen the ladies being a little bit more measured now. Good right hand from Anisha Maiman. Again, good counter combo from Anisha Maiman. She's seeing these attacks coming quite easily out of Devon Ray Khos. Which yeah. is probably what Khos is resorting to every now and then, the spinning, the something different. Yes, trying to make her think, especially because she's on the outside, you know, Anisha's reading most of what she's throwing, finding her own strikes when she's on the offensive. And, and pretty much putting Devon off of her rhythm. Eyes wide open from Devon Ray Khos. Devon looks like she's got a, a big bruise on the eye there. I was checking if it's maybe a bit of a cut. Or a tattoo. No, it's a mouse under her <laughs> eye. Oh, that has big certainly begun game. developing. Definitely something that uh, Nisha's busy landing her strikes, hitting her flush in the face. So something we might see develop over the, this round and over the next two. If it goes the distance. Not a lot of inside leg kicks down low that we're seeing, even though it looks like it's on offer for both fighters. Yeah. It's strange. Definitely, if you look at the, where their eyes are, are focused, they're both looking at each other in the face. So maybe a bit of chin hunting going on here as opposed to necessarily looking for the leg kicks, looking for the body shots. A nice flying knee there from Anisha. Puts Devin up against the rope. She moves out. Oh, finishes with a big elbow and left hook flurry. The Pride Fighting Academy army at the back behind us are up on their feet. This is a fantastic bout, ladies and gentlemen, that you're getting to watch. The best in women's Muay Thai coming out of Cape Town, South Africa. Both these fighters hail from Cape Town, and they're putting on a show tonight. So you got that extra minute. There's that mouse under the eye. We're going to see if there's going to be an end swell that's being produced out of the corner of... Devin Ray Khos doesn't seem to be an issue. They don't seem to be attending yeah, to it. Yeah, they're not too busy to focus about that. I know there's some boxing guys right now who will be having an absolute apoplexy <laughs> watching that and knowing that there's nothing being sure, done about it. Sure. But this is Muay Thai. They're made out of sterner stuff. And at the same time, you're almost expecting some blood at, at some point. Uh, not really something you're going to put an insole on to, to, to stop. More likely going to put adrenaline into the cut or you know, put some Vaseline in there. I haven't seen Dave do anything like that, so maybe, you know, maybe it's just a bit of a bruise, just a little bit of blood into the eye. He knows maybe his not, fighter. Maybe not too, too much major swelling, it's maybe just more of a bruise. I'm sure he's seen it in the training room before, he knows yeah, his sure. fighter. And you know, Michael Menemini, if, if there is a close-up that ever goes to his arm, you're going to notice an armband, and underneath that it's hol holding and housing a couple of end swells, or a couple of Q-tips, yeah. that I'm sure are soaked in adrenaline. There we go. All right, going to the championship round here. Round number four. Devon looking determined. 
But she forgot her gum guard. <laughs> Smiling, goes back. She's so keen to get in. it on. <laughs> Swelling doesn't look too bad. It looks like no, it's it a mark. looks all right, yeah. Focus on the faces. Looking at each other eye for eye. The shins clash. Bit more composure from Devon now. She's staying out of range. I'm not sure if that's the best move for her right now, but obviously been walking into a lot of punches. Maybe waiting to see what Anisha does opening round. Find her feet. There's not a lot of guessing when it comes to Devon Rakos. She walks straight. She comes in straight and she announces it as she's doing it. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. She needs to keep her hands up and fight from the guard. Step through, elbows, big body kicks like that. That's, what, that's the way that you're going to stop Anisha coming forward. And of course, you know, as you're throwing those, <laughs> it's, it's easy to sit on the side of the ring and say, hey, you should be kicking someone's body. But by the fourth round, your legs are tired. Even in the first round, to, you know, you throw a couple of those kicks and they work, but eventually you start feeling, I can't throw the kicks anymore. Flurry coming there from Anisha, coming over the top of the elbow into the hairline of Devon Rechos. First professional Muay Thai fight, and she is doing everything that she's taught. Yeah, and keeping Devon at range this fight as well. I mean, this round. Can't get greedy with that elbow, though. Devon Ray is going to be waiting for it now. Yeah, definitely needs to work the combos going in. That's what happens. She started with a flurry and finished with the elbow. It's a good way to work it. Devon sneaks a little elbow in as she comes in. Twenty seconds left in this fight. Ah, in this round. Um, Mike sliding from the corner, you know, follow up, use your combinations. We've seen her doing that throughout the round. It's something she's well trained at. There we go, the flurry comes through, Dev covers up, and, you know, and Nisha's finding those, those, those targets, opening up, steps in with the elbow, lands the punch. Fairly simple work, but it's super efficient and super effective. Walks from the fourth round with the hands in the air. Man, oh man, the Pride Fighting Academy Army are up on their feet, cheering on Anisha Maiman. She's looking spectacular in her first fight. Her face hasn't got a single mark on it. Exactly the same as when she walked into the ring. And she is looking comfortable and she looks in charge. Trying to pick up what Mike's saying to her, yeah. What I love about Mike is even the positive encouragement sounds like he's shouting at you and we can hear it from the, from the other side of the ring, yeah. Both fighters are very calm in the corner. You know, Devin Ray is having a conversation with David, her coach. Yeah, as they're going to this final round, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what Dave's saying there. They can't really just sit back. That I don't feel like they think that they're winning this fight or, you know, it's going for broke now. It doesn't look like there's panic in their corner. I don't know if it's more of a, you know, we'll just see what the judges throw out at us because, you know, Devin Ray has put in a volume of work. Yeah, she's she's taken a I shot. mean, she's doing what she can. She's got her guard up. She's doing, you know, the necessaries. But Anisha's just finding the, those gaps. And I think it was always thought that, you know, Devin Ray Khosa's natural stance is a high guard when she walks in. She's going to be a sitting duck for those kicks around the ribs underneath the elbow. And sure. that's exactly what Anisha Maiman is making her pay with. So yeah, I think maybe the, the word of advice from David was just pick up the volume. That's the only way you're going you're to beat Anisha. You have to, you know, play by a game. Just keep throwing. Last round, two minutes to, to leave it all in the ring. Oh, nice jab there. Another one's catching her. Oh, Anisha swinging the elbows elbow. in the clinch, holding onto the arm. That made contact. You could see sure. the wincing of the eye from Devin Ray Close. Yeah, and there's the blood, blood all over. Our first blood, the pro fights. No elbow guards. And Anisha Maiman is down. smiling. down, the crowd's loving it. Girls are throwing reckless abandon. They're both smiling about yeah, this. Yeah. Oh, big swing. Lots of blood trickling down. Wow, not even trickling, that's pouring. That's water falling out the side of her face. Wow. And that adrenaline must be spiking right now. She's still coming forward. That's why we've seen the smile on her face. Referee jean de Blaine stops the fight, brings Devin Ray to the side. We're going to have a look at that cut so we can stop the bleeding. Okay, oh, so great. 
great cut in the side of the eye there. That's right a pretty gash. Just above gash. the temple. I think that must have come from one of those overhand elbows that Anissa was throwing. And on the hairline at the top she of the skull one? as well. She's got another one underneath the thumb of David Dornbrack. Unless wow. that's just the blood from the other cut. No, no I that's think that's a another cut there in the hairline. Yeah, you're right. Whoa. We've seen this open. They've got a minute, I think maybe a minute or two, to, to stop the blood there. Anisha walking forward. She slipped oh. this elbow in here as Devon's arm was brought down in the guard. That was nasty. And there we see Devon smiling as the blood starts trickling down. She's used to blood. She works with, with ink and needles and they're back to it again. Last 40 seconds of this round. The volume from Maimon, the explosiveness from Maimon, who's making it pay. Big dividends here to Anisha Mayhem Maimon. Steps in, smiling, fifth round, and they're still smiling. They're still going hard. They hit everything full flood. 15 seconds remain. And Devon's still in it, you know. We're not seeing her shy away. She's still ready to take the shots and giving it back if she can. 10 seconds remain. Smile from Nisha Maiman. Nice body kick there. Grabs the foot, swings her. Seconds out. There we go. Well done to what these. A fight. Wow, well done. You're getting great visuals here. Yeah, you see Muay Thai is it's not a game. These girls put in the hard work. Got some big shots, some big elbows from Anisha Mayman raining down on Devon. It's coach David Dornbrack applies some pressure to try and stop the blood. I think we have a pretty good idea of where this fight went. Opening bout of our pro card. Phantomweight fight between Devon Echoes and Nisha Mayman. Five rounds of action, wall, wall to wall. And Nisha celebrating three celebrations before the announcements made. But I think, you know, it was pretty clear. Anisha kept Devon at bay, worked real well with the flurry of shots that she was giving, stepped in with the elbows, found the target that she was looking for. And eventually in that fifth round, cut Devon. She had a cut in the middle of her head, in the hairline, and one massive cut on the outside of her left eye. Pouring out her face there. I love our game, Devon still was. Blood was coming out of her face, but she just kept pushing, taking the shots, and Nisha didn't let up. I think that was, you know, shark smiling blood in the water. Kept going. You can see in the top left corner, ladies bind to each other with respect. Devon still got the towel to her eye. Great fight. As we await the judge's decision. A massive round of applause for both these ladies. Five rounds of pulsating bell to bell action takes us to the judges' scorecards where we have a unanimous decision all to your winner and fighting out of the blue corner from Pride Fighting Academy, Anisha Iron Maiden Mayman. Well done to Anisha Mayman fighting out of Pride Fighting Academy. Still running around, still full of energy. Bouncing in around the ring, calling her, her teammates in, maybe looking for a photograph. There you go. Well done, Team PFA. Michael Nemini. Did you have a look at the replays here? See Anisha working, coming up the top, hitting those punches, looking for the body shots. Just did a great job of uh, maintaining range and keeping the volume up. I think early on, Devon may be engaging. You know, that's that's the strategy she would have had to adopt was to get on the inside of Anisha. But with the flurry that Anisha was just throwing, Devon definitely needed to keep a guard up. Anisha doing well. Every time given Devon's guard went up, she just kicked the body. And I mean, there's not really much you can do about that right now. But still, game to the end. 
Great to see five rounds of action. I also love how you see Devon Zay. Devon Zay neatly done up there by the fifth round. Hair was loose, tangled, going wild. Cracking shots, Nisha Maimon focused. Take another look backstage. That's Pasquale Amoroso. And behind him, Pedro Casoma warming up for the fights later on. Next up, we have Rafael Wozniak in the red corner. Pasquale fighting out of Italy. WMO international champion defending his belt here against Nero Gombo to that one. The following contest to go a distance of five rounds at a 68 kilogram catch weight fight. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you first, he'll be fighting out of the blue corner with the blue trunks, weighing in at 67.7 kilograms and standing 1.78 meters tall with a combined fight record of 14 wins and six losses. Fighting out of Hong Kong in Cape Town, Matthew Lee. And his opponent returning to TFP, ladies and gentlemen, no stranger to us in the Cape Town crowd, fighting out of the red corner and weighing in at 65.3 kilograms with the red trunks and a combined fight record of 18 wins against 13 losses. He fights out of Ty Hollex in Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the fireman, Rafael Wozniak. as we go into our second pro bout of the evening. Two of Cape Town's favorite Muay Thai sons, Rafael Wozniak in the red corner, fighting out of Taholix Cape Town, up against Matthew Murray, fighting out of Moncon Muay Thai. These guys have been in the scene for a long while. Both of them represented their province, fought at SAs. So they've been teammates too. Known each other for a long time, I'm sure too. Catch weight at 68 kgs. I know Matthew Murray had a tough cut yesterday. See had a little bit in his face. Said to me that <laughs> this evening that it was one of the toughest he's done. I think it's been a while since he's, he's been in the ring. Raf, his last fight was out against Nedo Gomba. 
took some damage there. All smiles in the backstage, getting stitched up. He's keen to get back to action here as he faces off against Matthew Murray. The guy's adopting a shorter white crew. Giving thanks usually to your trainer, your family, the sport itself. Again, five rounds, three minutes this time, with a two minute rest in between. Third man in the ring, Jean de Blaine. Looking for a cracker fight here, some action. Last time we saw Rafael Wozniak in the ring, you got to cast your mind back to TFP1. He went the distance in a brutal exchange with Nedo Gomba in the main event of that. It took him a long time to recover from that fight. His shin was especially chopped up, you know. As most of the opponents for Nedo Gomba will attest to, you know, it's it's you're fighting against a guy who absolutely throws daggers and razor blades at you all day long. And it's not uncommon to look the way that Rafael did, but here we have him back in the ring. It's an agreed catch weight. And like you said, hard cut over five rounds of three minutes. Is that going to make a big difference towards the end? Time will tell. Yeah, both these guys just having broken to their 30s. Rafael, 31, Matt, 31 years old. That might also be a little bit of an effect, but you know, putting in the hard rounds in the gym, getting all that work done. These guys came here to fight, cuts behind them. I know Raf in that fight with Nedo, it was his second second fight with Nedo. And uh, in the first one, maybe a little bit closer, Raf had a bit of injuries going into that fight, obviously knowing what happened in the background, being from my gym. But I think he's had a pretty good camp around. I'm not too sure what Matt's camp was like. I mean, I, I'm friends with him, I also have him on Instagram, so I do see what he's doing there. And yeah. He said to me, he's feeling good, feeling rehydrated, but we'll see how it goes, you know, once you start hitting those deeper rounds, if we get that far, um, the fatigue must start to set in. And packing an experienced head coach in terms of fights, Carlos Skippers at Hong Kong, so you know that he's got good at sound advice coming back at him, you know, mainly a, a K1 exponent, but also a big fan of Muay Thai. And of course, Nicholas Radley in the corner of Rafael Wozniak, that old tried, trusted and tested combination of the two. Like father and son almost, almost at the same kind of age. But hey, <laughs> Ty Hollicks is producing a lot of good fighters down the stretch, down the years. Mong Kong, off to a start with Matthew Lee Murray. Yeah, Rafal, you know, came to the gym, told us he wanted to fight. Got into his first amateur fight in a K1 match in Get In The Ring. Knocked out his opponent. Um, yeah, so from there, just been working his way. We know he's got a lot of power. He likes to throw down. And I remember that fight because it was in the midst of one of the worst fires that Cape Town has ever yeah. had. And he was pulling 16, 17 hour shifts trying to extinguish a city-wide blaze while training for the fight and then decided to have a fight. Smoker's lung? Yeah, oh, come on, whatever. <laughs> yeah, looking sharp here. He put his fist into the neutral corner. Raf looking, looking to put his mark on this fight early on. Matt's usually quite composed. Um, can take a, a big shot. We've seen him, you know, in some in some barn burners as well. Looking for the body there. Took Marie a kick, claiming. To, kick to the hip, I think. Maria claiming and a bit of a, a box shot there. That's when I say box, I'm referring to the guard that they use for their genital area. Not a steel cup anymore, is it? More of a cricket cup, a plastic cup. I'm not too sure what these guys are wearing. Raf probably wearing a, a twins cup, like the steel Muay Thai cups. Pretty good for defense. You don't really feel much when you get there, but there's that, that pressure shot that you get. How does um, your foot feel kicking it? Mm, you take a bit of a strike. Matt working, working Raf into the corner. Raf evades, works his way back to the center of the ring. So both these fighters got good fight experience. You can really see the, the outside of, of Matt's lead leg there taking a bit of, of damage. There's a bit of waltz going red. Raf hitting with that outside left. What do you make of the plasters that you see on Matthew Lee Marais' knees? Both knees similarly plastered. Is that what that is? Sorry, I thought those were welts. 
No, there's a big welt above his leg though in the thigh area. Would that come from this fight or would he bring it in with him? Yeah, I think that I don't think I saw that when he came in. Yeah, maybe just dealing with a little bit of uh, you know like meniscus issues there, trying to tape it up, maybe even the hamstring rash sticking that elbow in. We saw coach Nick Radley um, showing him that you know as Mac comes in, you've got to stick that. Mac's got a very wide guard, very tight style, hands up front, very much replicating his initial trainer. Russell also used to fight like that with his hands out. But he's, he's landing his shots. Raf shakes shake his head. Great shows exchanges. Him that, he, that he, you know, he got those shots in, but here he comes again. Great exchanges from both fighters. Raf, a little smile on his face. I think we're starting to see a little bit of fatigue from Matt, but he's, he's done well with the boxing. As you know, keeping his range, he's definitely got the reach. Great the straight left. doing well with, with the, the, left, the body kicks and, the, and the, the kicks to the leg early on. He steps forward with a switch jab. And Rafael's doing the right thing, being Whoa. the shorter fighter, cutting that distance and throwing elbows on the inside when he can. Yeah, I think this is something we see from Raf as well. You know, like a lot of the times, he, he takes his big shots, takes his head, and then comes with his own wild shots. But he maybe needs to put those hands up, cover up a little bit. I know this is the first round, but you know, make sure that you don't take too much damage early on. And it definitely you know, increases that fatigue. Blinking a bit there, stepping with that elbow. Wow, tight, tight first round. Matt did well with the boxing. Raf started out very well with the kicks. You know, it's hard to see in terms of who the happier of the fighter is because Matthew Lee Maria, what I've noticed about his demeanor, it's, he's not like the most excited guy that he gets to come around. He's like a very calm guy. He doesn't show a lot of emotion. Raf, you can see the emotion. It's written all over his face. He's a, he's a very happy guy. You can see he looks like he's happy in the corner. Matthew Lee Maria, a lot more composed, a lot more measured. Yeah, for sure. But that's his default setting. Yeah, and also like, you know, <laughs> we've seen that in the fight itself, as Raf's landing shots, Matt's just, you know, standing there, he's, he's doing the side head wobble, which is often like, also an indication like, yes, you got me there, but I'm not really feeling it, but he's not as emotive as Raf with the smiles and so on. We're still trying to clean up the blood from the ladies' fight before this. And preceding this fight, Nisha Maiman and Devin Ray Khos didn't job on each other, although it was mainly Anisha Maiman, but in this fight, We've got to give them as dry a ring as possible for these two men to operate in. Who's the happier fighter after that opening round? Yeah, it's difficult to say. I think Matt, you know, you can definitely see he had, had a lot more success with his boxing. He's had a few boxing fights. Um, moving his head around, that's something for to Raf maybe to think about, to look for big looping uh, hooks. Uh, Raf's trying to stick the elbows down the middle, but, but he's definitely, you know, at a disadvantage for the, for the reach. So Matt doing all the boxing. Rafting well with the kicks. Um, it was only the opening round. We scheduled for five, so we'll see what happens now as the guys come out for the second. Maybe still feeling each other out. Maybe finding their own feet in the fight. Round number two. Seconds have been asked to leave the ring, vacate the area, get the fighters on their feet so we can go again. Another four rounds to come, three minutes a round. Out of the bucket, Rafael Wozniak comes. From the neutral corners, they will move to the middle, and away we go for round number two. All right. Straight away, Rafael Wozniak welcomes him to the second round. Even though Matt's the, the, you know, the, the taller fighter, I think Rafael needs to be careful of him coming in, so use his teeth, use those big left hooks, because Matt's coming straight down the pipe, but he is leaving his turn a bit exposed. I hear Nick Radley shouting the tie, tie instructions, calling for low kicks, and then to move. So as Matt's coming in to hit the leg, maybe hit the body, Raf looking for a catch here, but Matt doing well, landing his strikes, getting the punches off. And this is where it becomes uncomfortable to oh, watch because hey. you know that the points in the elbows and the knees yeah, are going to sure. be making contact. And I think we also see that Matt's not very comfortable in the clincher. You can see he gets in there, grabs tight. That's also from the K1 background. You know, the, the clincher is really a space where you, you can land one strike and, and tie it up, then the ref will break it up. But in Muay Thai, we get to work through it. You know, Raf throwing two knees there while Matt just sort of uh, tied him up in the clinch work. So maybe that's something for, 
for Raf to think about. You keep seeing Raf, as Raf throws that. Matt's catching him with, with big shots on his power side, his left hand landing in, in almost a, like a slight hook, but definitely coming straight down the pipe as well. And catching Raf. There's that low kick that Nick was calling for. Big kick puts Raf, a uh, little wobbles him a bit. Big body oh. shot in return. Under the arm and onto the rib cage. That couldn't have felt good. Matt Dingwall with a flurry here. Uh, landing big shots, followed up with that big body kick. The found needs to make sure that he either checks the kicks or slips off on the punches like that. Good Great inside, inside leg kick. kick. Yeah, snap. <laughs> you owe me a coke? <laughs> Still a minute left in this round. Quite a frantic one. Rafal comes over the top, puts the elbow into the top of Matheli Maria's head. Again with the inside leg kick from Rafal Wozniak. Needs to focus if he's going to try and catch those teeps. Needs to put his top hand over the foot to make sure that Matt can't pull it out there. Good right hand from Matthew Lee Marais, just as he goes in to close the distance with a clinch. Again with the right hand. Matt Lee Marais has got oh, a good right it. hand on him. Yeah, definitely. Definitely you can see that boxing style, you know. Now he switched to orthodox stance. Also interesting. I think Raph looks a little bit more comfortable when, when Matt's not in southpaw. Matt Lee Marais really needs to just throw that right hand. He seems to not be able to miss. Yeah, it's definitely like in this ladder half of the round. Open up a little bit, exposed Raf, landed those shots. Raf, he, when he's smiling like that at the end of the round, you know it's a bit of frustration. Well, if you're watching this, you found us on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. Tell all your friends, Tyholics Fight Promotions. Follow us on Facebook, Tyholics Fight Promotions, and Instagram, Tyholics underscore fight underscore promotions. Hit us up in the comment section. Tell us what you're seeing. Let us know what you're thinking. And please remember, TFP5, level up. It's coming your way 23rd of July, 2022, from the Grand West Arena right here in Cape Town, South Africa. The headliner is going to be revealed in the coming weeks. Mixed card pros, pro-ams, and amateurs. Anthony Mailer makes his return against Pedro Casoma, who's going to be fighting after this fight, up against Mont Avery. Shane Deacon up against Jean-Luc Ardendorf, a title defense. Of course, Ardendorf earned his way into that title com picture. And Ishak Ibrahim also going to be making his first title defense against Paul Combal, one of the guys who came up trumps at the last Tyholix Fight Promotions event. And you know, we can also sell you merch all day long, baby. It's available here live. And also, if you want to get the merch, admin at tyholics.com is the place to send your message. As we go into the replays, I'm sure they're going to come. Round number two, a lot more violent. We see Nick busy addressing maybe some blood there from Raf. You know, he's, he's taking a lot of big shots. So he needs, right to needs to keep his hands up. And he also needs to look for earlier, the same thing we said with Devin. Look for the body shots, the big kicks. Uh, I hear Nick calling for kick in the leg and then move. Um, yeah, it's not often that you see the smaller guys stand on the outside, but you know, it's maybe something that you can do with, with a, a boxer like Matthew Murray, who keeps putting that pressure on the front leg. So hit it, move off. Matt's doing everything he needs to do, though. You know, he's landing straight shots. He's, as Raf's moving in to throw his own shots, his hands are up and he's catching him on the counter. Oh, the joys of flexibility, something I've never been gifted with. Just bend him any way you want to, Nick. No problem. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Same. The only thing is I just get to lift my leg a little bit higher because I'm tall. <laughs> <laughs> Round number three and away we go. Okay, Raf. Looking a little bit more intent here. He's actually stepping forward now. Matt staying light on his feet, bouncing on the outside. <laughs> the music intensifies as the third round kicks off. Oh, flying Superman there from Matt. This is where Raph needs to focus on getting those, those knees in because, oh, Matt breaks there, lands some shots. Because Matt doesn't look as comfortable in the clinch. Not sure if that's something that uh, Kareem Nick Ray has spoken to, to Raph about in the corner. Oh! Matt with a big shot to the, just under the arm of Rafael Wozniak. There was a spray, there was a sound, and it looked like it hurt, but Wozniak walks it off. 
the crack. We've got a little bit of, looks like, smoke coming down from the outside. Yeah, I don't see it on the camera, but <laughs> in the ring, it's quite electric, this fight we've got going here. Inside, Inside. leg kick from Rafael. Oh! At least he's slipping those punches a bit now. That last kick looked a little bit on the dodgy side from Rafael Wozniak, just considering where his foot ended up. Legs looking a little bit tired. He's slipping, but I hear Nick Bradley calling for the inside elbow as Matt's coming forward. Matt doing really well there. Catches oh, that. John Rafael with a big right shot. Hand. I wonder if that's going to get a count here. Nope. John Dre calls, carry on. But the way that he measured him for that right hand, it's for like, sure. I am going to hit this. Yeah, Matt's, Matt's got that range. He knew that, you know, the distance Rafael was at was perfect for that right straight. It also looked like he had the time to think about it and place it where he yeah. wanted to. He was walking forward, had Rafael on the back foot, so, you know, something easy way to do is just, you could even just lift his leg and he would have fallen there, but landed the strike. Still coming forward, still landing the shots. Rafael on the back foot here. Yeah. The stakes are getting raised with every minute that passes by. Matt catching, catching Raf on the counters. Walks in with the body knee. And I can tell you one thing, it's not looking like Matthew Lee Maria was the guy who dropped yeah. 500 grams yesterday before the weigh-in to make the weight for this fight. He's looking better and better as the fight's going on. In fact, with it being a catch rate fight, Rafal was already on weight before weigh-in, so... It's also, you know, that, that fight with the scale that you have is a good mental setting, a good way to get yourself keyed in for the fight. Sometimes, when you don't have to make the weight, uh, it's, it's a bit of an adverse effect. The blood starting to appear on Wozniak's face. He's beginning to look like Batman's Joker. We're actually seeing a, a little smile here and there from that, uncharacteristically so. But he's obviously enjoying himself, but then he's landing. You know, when that happens, you start to, you feel yourself in there. Raf trying to do what he can to, to get back on the attack. Third round finishes. I think Matt had the upper hand through most of that fight there. Raf shaking his head, a little smile, bleeding. Tie lipstick application given out. Taking damage. To Rafael Wozniak. Everything's red in the red corner. And again, it's the Q-tips up the schnoz of Rafael Wozniak. Rajit hanging low on the arm, maybe tied up for him. Matt looking pretty composed in his corner. Fairly fresh looking, as we said. Doesn't look like he was the guy who did the big cut. I think a total of close to 12 kgs, he said. Rounds four and five are on the way here. The replay is of round number three. Raf started out putting the pressure on. It was working for him until this big shot. That was really like something that turned the fight around. Matt uh, turned the round around. Uh, Matt started landing this catch. Big shot on the chin, on the button. Raf going backwards. Just slide referees, that into the textbook. Yeah, referee's decision not to call that a drop. Matt with the, the Superman punch that actually landed, glanced the chin of Rafael Wozniak. So the decision not to call a count, right? Wrong? Well, I mean, that's, that's up to the referee. I think he has a look at how the fight is doing. Raf did get up really quickly. He wasn't looking dazed. He was smiling, but that's, you know, that's Raf. And we've seen that there. You see these big shots landing. Um, but that's, that's a, yeah, a call you make on the fly. Discretionary. Also, because referee. he was going back, lifting his foot, you know, he would have fallen regardless of the punch, but the punch did land really flush. Um, yeah. Matt taking a few deeper breaths now. I think this, this two-round... Ach, this two-minute uh, round break is working nicely for Matt. Seems to be recovering nicely. Whereas Raf spending most of his time in the corner getting blood work done. Well, I think that Not round... Not very light on his feet anymore. Squared things up a lot in the favor of Matthew Lee Marie. Yeah. He could also quite conceivably be a round up. We don't know. Yeah, I think so. Good right hand again from Matthew Lee Marais. Rash puts in a, a big inside leg kick though. We're seeing Matt has actually switched his stance quite a lot. He's, he's favoring now that, that traditional stance instead of going to the southpaw. Raf pressing forward, lands a big body shot. Matt answers in favor on the arm. Big shot to the chin, wobbles Raf a little bit up against the rope. Crowd goes wild, inside sneaky elbow from him. Good place there with uh, both hands on the head to look for a knee. Nice check there from Raf. Wow, what a high check that was. Yeah. 
Good right hand, oh, and another big one punches. comes in. Looking for the, the glancing elbow again. Matt's doing really well here, you know, he's staying composed, he's not just rushing in, he's looking for, he's looking for those openings. And Raf's given them. He needs to keep his hands maybe a little bit tighter, tuck his chin a bit, not eat so many shots from, from the punches. Look for that low kick. There it comes. You can see Raf's hands really lazy, but fatigued there. He punches aren't as effective as, he, as he'd want them to be. The zip looks like it's been taken out. Yeah. But still, it's late rounds. Even a lazy punch can catch a fighter. Matthew working on his guard, still slipping. Oh, good jab. Nice and stiff jab, semi-hooked by yeah, I Rafael think they, Wozniak. I think if they're going to be lazy, you've got to put the weight behind them, make sure they're stiff. The kicks as well, you know, you've got to be going forward on your kicks. Can't be leaning back too much. Still power there. And there's still power coming back from Matthew Nimeray. Yeah, for sure. Both of these guys turning it up here in the fourth round. Good straight right. Straight left from Matthew Nimeray. The first one, the second one just missed. Raph walk, walking him down, looking for a, a wild elbow. Swimming. Oh, it's two big shots, a one-two deep to keep him at bay. The money shot for Matthew Lee Maria, that's straight. Yeah. And also he's, he's, he's finding Raph's opening by like touching the gloves, using his hook to, to set that up. Raph slipped it there. Oh, jumping elbow, hits him in the side of the neck. Twenty seconds left in this fourth and penultimate round. You know, dare I say it, both these fighters, although this is a catch weight, it looks like there is a clear divisional difference yeah. between the two. Yeah. See with Raf being on weight already and Matt cutting, he's probably walking around a good like four to five Ks bigger than the fight at the moment. Catches wow. him as he jumps there and actually hits him in the in the thigh. Fourth round closes, Raf still with that. Look on his face like I'm doing everything I can, but I'm not too sure what I'm supposed to be doing more. He's playing high risk though. He's going to try and close the distance in terms of the scoring by throwing these fundamentally out of par kind of shots. You know, he's just going for the winging, he's going for the spinning, he's going for the fancy. Because the straight stuff's not working. The basics yeah. are not working. And I think it's a lot to do with the size difference that he's experiencing. And what is coming back from Matthew Lee Marais in terms of that straight left punch and that big kick to the arm. Yeah, and that's also throwing Rafael off his rhythm. You know, the, the fact that Matt every now and again comes with a big kick as Raph's walking in. That's how you stop the boxers. You hit them in the body. You hit the arms. You make sure that they don't have the momentum. <laughs> as we see Raph taking a tumble there, hitting the back of the head as he jumped forward. It's working well for Raf kicking that inside leg, but Matt's still landing his shots because he's got the range. I think that's one of the shots that Nick Radley was calling for, is hitting that outside leg, especially when he's in the orthodox stance. And, and it's relentless from Matt, you know. He's putting on that pressure similar to what we saw in the last fight between Anisha and, and Devon. You know, it's just that high volume. And Raf walking in similarly to the way that Devon did. You know, and the, I've got to say, there's a very even decoration of the thighs of Matthew Lee Marie. Inside and outside, yeah. the paintwork is all oh, the same. It's red and blue. <laughs> <laughs> Colors of the Thai flag. <laughs> <laughs> red, white, and blue, both guys stepping in for the last round. Round number five about to get underway. No traditional bounce there from Raf. He just walks it in. They're about to hug it out. I'm not sure. No, nope, touch of the gloves. They don't <laughs> trust each other. <laughs> Stalking coming in from Raf. I think Matt knows that he's pretty much got this in the bag. He just needs to make sure that he doesn't do anything stupid, leave himself too exposed. Can work on the outside now. Maybe look to fatigue Raf a bit by chasing him around the ring. And what Raf needs to do is just square off there, stop him from moving around, put him into a corner maybe, stalk him down, kick the leg, stop his momentum, stop his movement. I think Raf's coming in there looking for maybe an elbow, trying to slice Matt. 
It almost looks like he's trying to cut the ring to force Matthew Lee Marie onto his right elbow, onto yeah. his right hand. Yeah. And you can see he's got his hands up. He's coming in for that shot. He knows that maybe if he can get a big cut, finish the fight on the blood stoppage. Uh, He's hunting with that elbow, the arms up, the hands out. You can see it's coming. Yeah, he's looking for it, but maybe he needs to set it up. He needs to throw a couple of punches. There's a big, you know, even if it's an overhand, Matt's hands are down. He's moving around well, but he's, he's fatigued himself. This is the fifth round. If you're going for broke, oh, he needs some big shots there, Raph, as he comes into that. Looks for the little elbow there. Weight cuts aside, the conditioning of Matthew Lee Maria to make the weight has been remarkable. Yeah. No, look, he's did great throughout this fight. He stayed active, he's been moving, he's been landing his shots, he's been, you know, the footwork's been great as well. Switching between stances, landing his shots. And I think that maybe caught Raph unawares. I think he was expecting Matt to maybe be a little bit more tired after that big cut yesterday. Oh, just missing with the left elbow. Still got a minute left in this round. Shane calling for a double jab, stepping right elbow. <laughs> Wouldn't be a bad idea. Work your way in. Oh, great right hand from Rafael Wozniak. But the zip has been taken out. It's not having the effect that it might have had in the first round. Yeah, and Matt's still doing well. You know, he's, he's definitely outpointing Raf in this round. Still landing those shots, pretty much flush. We haven't seen, besides that one big catcher and drop, we haven't seen anyone go down yet, so... These guys, you know, pretty well conditioned, taking a shot. They say you can't gym your chin, but I guess these guys didn't need to because they ate all their jungle oats when they were kids. 20 seconds remaining of the fifth and final round. Oh, wild swing, getting the clinch. Body starts at the knee. Matt responds, looks for a big elbow. 10 seconds left. Both guys tired, but they're still out there throwing. So theatrical, the last 20 seconds of this round. So, oh, hey, Raph sneaks in there, uh, spinning over there. Matt takes it on the chin, shakes it off as uh, ending up the run, bulk jitters. Both guys hanging over the ropes, left it all out there. Matthew Murray doing well to evade most of Rafael's strikes. Raph trying to work his way on the inside. Definitely finding himself at a disadvantage on the reach, the height. And also, you know, taking a lot of those shots as he's walking in. Still got a smile on his face though. Hey, sneaky. Does a little stance with him, drops down. Guys hug it out. Go to each other's corners, showing respect. Matt gets some order there from crew, Nicholas Radley. Rafael laughing in the opposite corner there. Hands up, appreciation to the crowd. We await the judge's decision, yeah. Referee Jean-Dre Blaine brings the guys to the middle. We're about to hear this announcement. After five rounds of professional Muay Thai action at TFP4, we go to the judges' scorecards where they have rendered a unanimous decision victory all to your winner and fighting out of the blue corner, Matthew Lee! Murray! Well done to Matt Murray. Gets a big round of applause from this crowd. The guys win five rounds. End to end. Blood pouring from Rafael's face. Matt working hard. Had to fight off the big fatigue from his cut yesterday. Called his team in for a photograph. Calls the cameraman over. Great show of respect from the guys. As I said, you know, they've been teammates before. They've known each other, friends outside of the ring. Put it aside for this match. As uh, Rafael's 
team, his crew gets in there, as well as his two corner man, men. <laughs> Take a look at the replays. Yeah, this is the end of the fifth round, Raph. Getting a sneak of elbow in there. <laughs> if I look at Nick's face, I think he was saying something like, you should have been doing that in the fight, not after the ball gone. Especially when he's coming in close here. You know, the, the distance was a problem for him. Those big looping body kicks from Max kept him at bay though. And I think took that, that thunder out of him. This was the biggest shot probably of the fight. Max catching his, his teeth and, and following up with a big right straight. Matt doing well here, following up, combinations, punches in bunches, you know, hit in the body, hit in the head. Good work from him there. But I'm sure we'll see Raf bounce back as we often have before. Backstage, we've got Nero Gomba. Warming up, final two fights in our card tonight. Nedo looking to stake his claim on the WMO, World Muay Thai Organization International welterweight belt. Up against Pasquale Amoroso from Vivenzio, Germany, Italy. Current holder of the, the belt, 66.67 kgs the upper limit of that division. You are back live at TFP4 Full Swing, and it's now come time for the penultimate bout on this evening's card. Five rounds of three minutes, professional Muay Thai in the super welterweight division. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you first, he'll be fighting out of the blue corner, weighing in at 69.3 kilograms and standing 1.82 meters tall, wearing the blue trunks with a professional record, 49 wins, 18 losses, 15 wins come by way of a knockout. He fights out of Nairobi, Kenya, by way of Winchester, England, presenting Martin! Avery! And his opponent standing 1.78 meters tall, weighing in at 67.6 grams, and fighting out of the red corner with the red trunks. A professional record of 10 wins and two losses. He fights out of Angola, top team, fighting out of Angola, ladies and gentlemen, introducing Pedro Casoma. Pedro Kasoma in the red corner, fighting out of Angola, up against Martin Avery, fighting out of Kenya, originally from England. He's got a massive fight record behind him, 49 wins, 18 losses, 15 of those wins coming by KO. Looking at Martin's 
accolades. You see, I see that he's been a Southern England champion, he's been a British champion and a European champion. But he says his goal is to get out there and win a, a world title. Pedro, on the other hand, is also, you know, he's fought on international fight cards, Muay Thai championships in 2017, world championship about 70 kgs in 2013. Maybe, as it doesn't say yet, that was as, a, as an amateur, but, you know, both of these guys coming out here to, to make a statement, putting African Muay Thai on the world stage. Now, you've been to Thailand, you fought in Thailand. Can you decipher the hieroglyphics on Avery's back? What are those tattoos significant? What do they mean? Yeah, so the Sakyan, those are traditional poke tattoos done in Thailand, you know, usually traditionally done with the bamboo. Um, they have different incantations and, and reasons behind them. Um, some of them are script, some of them are, you know, depictions of deities. I haven't seen up close what these are, uh, but I have a Hanuman on my back. I see he's got the a script line, which is power lines on his both of his shoulders. Um, it looks like maybe the Muay Thai Tiger, so that's like a very definite power tattoo right in the middle of his back. Sakyans, you know, traditional Thai style. They do a lot of, they believe in the incantations and the power that they come from, the warrior spirit kind of vibe. And yeah, <laughs> he's pretty much decorating them from top to toe. Appropriately. Yeah, for sure. Pedro Kosoma, not a lot known about him, but one thing I do know, Angola produce top level fighters, especially in legs and the arm styles of fighting. So K1, and let's see, maybe it's Muay Thai as well. Yeah, and he looks pretty game, 27 years old, 69 kgs. Let's see what these guys bring to the ring here. Yeah. Slight height and reach advantage for Avery. Well, reach actually going by one centimeter to Kasoma. The height by a centimeter to Avery. This is going to be a barn burner. I have a sneaking suspicion that it could steal the show. These guys both look like they want to get into each other immediately. And there we go, round number one, and straight away it's Avery with a straight kick to the leg. Avery with the definite Muay Thai styling. You see that stabbing knee he's got there. He teeped the, the lower leg, which you haven't seen very often, but that's a, a very big uh, thing in Thailand as well. Just, you know, keeps, it's kind of like the way that we use our jabs. Um, you just touch the front leg, stops the momentum, but also good for setting up other attacks. He hits it again. So very definitely, probably with his second, has lived in Thailand, fought in Thailand, trained there, uh, currently living in Kenya. Big left, looping left hook, followed by right kicks. That's you know, definite opening styling. There we see that long guard that I spoke about earlier, coming from Pedro. Put the elbow up, stick the arm out, protect your face, but also keep your opponent at bay. Oh, big flurry, you know, the return kicks are coming here. Got that Dutch style defense as well from Kasoma. He puts his arms down into the kicks using the forearms. Avery looking to sweep underneath. I mean, the styling these guys are showing is, is impeccable. It's, it's great to see this sort of level. Good checks, good kicks, and avoidance, you know, brilliant. An interested bystander is going to be Anthony Mailer, who will be watching the winner of this fight. He's down to fight Pedro Kosoma at TFP5. The cracks of these kicks, I can actually feel them in my own shins <laughs> when they're landing on each other's forearms and bodies. Kosoma's lightning fast off yeah, the floor so with quick. that foot. But Martin as well, you know, like, I mean, you, you can see them coming a little bit, but they, they're still getting up there quickly and, and he's landing effectively. Martin but could just be the guy who's tough and soaks it up. Getting his head down low in, in the clinch there, landing multiple knees. Pedro answers in kind. Nice avoidance. Great opening round. I mean, <laughs> they didn't leave anything towards feeling each other out here. They went straight to action. Again, pro Muay Thai rules five rounds of three minutes. Good check there. I mean, Avery, he's got all the basics down right. He's got good body position. You know, he's in the right position when he throws his kicks, his knees. He's good, a big good, fan good of the knees. Good clinch work. Big fan of the knees to the stomach, and it's and, working and, for him. And he really likes those, those, those stabbing knees. You know, he lifts his leg, then he points the knee forward and pushes it into the body of Pedro. Pedro relying mostly on his big kicks. There's a big cat. Nice avoidance of the sweep. Great to see that. 
and that was a kick that landed and the hamstring of Pedro Kostoma after that catch, it must have hurt. Oh, big knee landed by Avery, but he actually ate an elbow over the top there, so, you know, strike for strike. Both these fighters, you know, going guns out. I think they're doing really well here to actually land their shots. It's going to be difficult for the judge to say which one landed more. From my perspective, it looked maybe a little bit more like Martin Avery was landing the more effective strikes, especially in the clinch. But, I mean, Pedro did a good job as well. He didn't back down. Body language from both of them looks good. Great good. opening round. Just like I said, this one could steal the show. It's got the hallmarks and the makings of it. And it wasn't exactly a slow start either. Not at all. These guys went for it. Yeah. And like I said, they, you know, Martin might be born in England, fighting out of Kenya. They're putting the African Muay Thai that we're seeing here on, on display. You know, the gyms that they're fighting out of are, are in African countries, putting on the display on an African card. It's great to see. Replays coming right up, and I'm sure there's a lot of highlights that we're going to be able to enjoy, mainly Martin Avery's bodywork, and of course that speedy right kick from Pedro Kasoma. See, the amount of, of knees that he's landing in the clinch, I mean, that's sapping firstly i mean it takes away a lot of your energy receiving those knees but it's also you know those are points landing so if the the judges are looking at this properly he <laughs> ate a big elbow over the top there um yeah doing very well in the clinch strikes from the outside are good pedro also quick with his kicks nice long guard maybe just needs to be careful not to to leave himself too exposed to those body shots needs to maybe work a little bit more guys can look at maybe you know manipulating each other's bodies in the clinch pulling each other around so that you don't get static and, and end up taking all those shots to the body. See, if, if you're just standing in front of each other like that, you're going to be eating shots. So either you're working to throw your own shot or you may be working to pull him off. Guys are ready for the second round. Great avoidance there by Pedro. Jumping. Oi, round starts off flashed again. Oh. No quarter given. Oh, that big, noise. big, big, big kicks to the leg. Martin jumps up. He's ready to go but he's got to be careful you, there's only so many shots you can take Pedro coming out firing good check there hits the low kick again Martin I think maybe thinking that if he just steps forward he's going to land those elbows but those kicks are thundering into the thigh of Martin Avery Avery's just trying to shut the distance he's trying to take away that kick yeah. that Kasoma is landing but at the same time he's eating that kick and he's eating punches as well I think he maybe thought he has the advantage in the clinch so maybe if he gets in close and Kasoma maybe ties up with him he can start landing a little bit more knees and avoid you know as soon as he had range you're going to be eating those shots if you're coming in and he, so he gets into the clinch starts laying the knees he's unloading yeah working a bit wouldn't be surprised if we look for a little bit of a hip toss Ooh, little glancing elbow there from Pedro. Low kick again. I think that's that's a bit of a point that he should be working on. Just keep eating that leg. But these shots are thundering. And Kosova looks exactly the same shape and size that he was on the scale Ooh, yesterday. A little bit of a touch. Avery's put on a key or two overnight. You can see it. Yeah. Great work in the clinch from both guys here. Knees are coming in. Martin's got a good style where he draws his knee back and then pops it in. And sometimes when, when Pedro's giving him the space, he's, he's using that stabbing knee. You know, this is something that, that you see at the end of a training session in Thailand. 300 knees on the bag, this is kind of what it looks like. Guys just get in there, hold on to their perceived opponent, the bag, and just draw the knees. Great Muay Thai style. I'm loving that the referee's not jumping in here. The guys are both active. You know, this is Thai style. We don't need to break the clinch every time they, they get tied up because they're working here. They're we're looking working, for shots. We're working, yeah, exactly. That's what they're saying. Looking for shots. And, and I mean, that's tiring work. You know, a lot of the guys sometimes think that you're kind of resting in the clinch, but that's arms are getting sapped. Your body's taking the damage from the knees and, and obviously the, the effort of lifting a knee in the first place. Great work from the guys here. Oh, great little toss there. He sweeps him, lands up against the ropes. Good work from Martin. It's a tight run, difficult for the judges to call. I know Kasama's had a lot of good work on that, that leg of Avery. You can see how it's red and welting. But Martin's done well to close the space. As we said, he's trying to make sure that he doesn't stay on the outside, doesn't eat too many kicks, and he's, he's working in the clinch. Oh, oh big a big elbow. shot there. A little bit of fatigue in his own arms. Looks for the sweep again. Kasama jumps over it. Kostoma can't miss with that elbow coming in close. End of the second round, we see these guys are, have thrown with wanton disregard for each other and their own safety. They're just putting it all in there. 
It's going to be interesting to see how they come out in this third round after a two minute break. John Day breaks him up. Final shot. A little stick out of the tongue there. Both guys put their hands in the air. Crowd applauds them for their good work. Oh, trip of the seat. Martin taking some big breaths there. It's got two minutes to recover. You see Andy Pagado helping out in the Angolan corner there. He has Angolan roots. I mean, yeah, he's, he's born from in Angola. Russia, but he, uh, I think his mom is Angolan and he's got an Angolan passport as well. Might be completely wrong, but I know he's got an Angolan connection. Yeah, I, th I think you on the money there. We've known him for a while as well. Um, hurting his arm, I'm not too sure what happened, but he's, he's in a cast. He was scheduled to fight in the next TFP. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. Somebody made the mistake of breaking into his house oh, wow. with a knife and stabbed him. And uh, let's just say the person who stabbed him didn't leave in a condition which you could tell anybody his version of the story. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, I haven't spoken to him tonight. I just saw him walking around in the car. So thought maybe he slipped and fell on the playground. No, but South it's Africa. a much more vicious story. That's what happens. As these guys get back to work, Martin Avery putting on the pressure. Kasama smiling. Catch of the kick. Kicks out his back leg. It's good work for Martin. He keeps his head down. He goes into the clinch position, which he, he favors. I think he, find, he feels like he's the favorite in the clinch. Gets in there, goes to work, saps his opponent's body. But Pedro's not backing down, throwing everything at it. He's only had 12 fights. Two of those, two of his 10 wins coming by KO. 12 pro, how many amateur do you think this guy's had though? He looks class from start to finish. Avery's hanging in tough. I just tend to wonder who's winning the point scoring here. Who's the one that is affecting the eye of the judge the most? Yeah, both guys are working a lot. So I guess we're looking at effective strikes. Those tosses are important. You know, it's the second one in the round for Martin. So, oh, big little spinning elbow catches him on the bottom of the turn. He's wobbled him. He's got him rocked in the corner. Martin needs to look for a finish here. Maybe break the clinch. No, he goes back into the clinch. Starts to work the body. Patience could be key Another as well. He elbow, finds an elbow. Corners. Like Osoma Again. seems to have recovered a bit. Yeah. He's throwing his elbows in return. But I definitely say Martin, you know, sneaking this round. He's got the two sweeps. A hip toss or a toss over a sweep of his leg. Big cut on Avery's face. Is that from, you know, sticking his head down and walking into head clashes or possible elbow there? Also on the eye, in the fold of the eye. I see that middle second is actually also a, a Hanuman, which is, you know, never backing down, no surrender, general going to war. You also got to wonder when they're this close, the effect of the heads rubbing against each other. I know yeah, it's exactly. not intentional head clashes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it makes a difference. Yeah. And, and as I was saying earlier, Martin purposely puts his head down and walks in, so there's, there's you know, head clashes are bound to happen. Unavoidable. Walking into an elbow, then a big shot like that rocks him. But I think he's still got this run, despite having that cut and, you know, the last minute now maybe getting a few shots. Got the two sweeps, definitely rocked Kasoma. Might have done a bit more work to try and put him on his back, but that spinning back elbow, a little glance on the bottom of Kasoma's chin. He's still putting the forward pressure as well. That's, you know, that's important. Big knee by Domination. Martin Avery. And, and continually working. You know, you can see that they're getting tired, but it's about working even when you're tired. Great job from both these guys. Hands up. Both of them feeling very confident. Two more rounds left. The crowd show them the gratitude for what we've been seeing. It's a study of infighting by these two young fighters. Laying it all out for us on TFP4 full swing. Don't forget TFP5, the date has already been announced. The 23rd of July, 2022 here at the Grand West Arena. It's called Level Up and it's gonna be featuring Anthony Mailer potentially against Pedro Kasama, who's fighting right here right now. Shane Deacon makes a title defense against the number one contender, Jean-Luc Ardendorf. And Nixark Ibrahim makes his title defense against the number one contender of his division, Paul Combal.
We're getting to these replays of the third round. I like to see that little elbow that the Martin threw. It was as he stepped through with his left, through the right. I think he was going in upwards motion and caught Kasoma. Big sweep in early in the round. Caught him again with a with a hip toss <coughs> late in the round. And the other guys get straight back to work. Martin walking straight in. Hands up, but he's again looking to engage, looking for that clinch. That's where he likes it. Kasoma being frustrated by, by Martin just walking in, you know. You can see that he likes to strike from the outside. He's looking for those leg kicks, but it's sometimes difficult to, to find the power when you're on the back foot. But he's also doing well to whip them in. You know, this is the fourth round, but we're still seeing a lot of... Oh, he gets his own spinning back elbow, partially blocked there by uh, Martin's gloves. Half head, half glove. Yeah. Martin Avery is just playing the tough guy competition. Yeah, and he's, he's walking in, but he's, he, you know, he's effective. With, every time he gets in, he's landing at least two or three knees before Kasoma responds. There we saw three. He's making four. it worth his time. So we're seeing lots of work here, and, and I mean, he, he loves it there. You can see he doesn't want to be anywhere else. He doesn't want to be on the outside where he can also get picked apart, you know? Because he knows the speed advantage exactly. probably lies with Kasoma. Yeah. And this is so effective for him. It's also draining Big Kasoma, spinning elbow. So. You know, if, if Ant Mello's watching this, got to make sure you, you suck your opponent's power out, get inside there, tie him up. You can see we've already seen a bit of speed dropping off Kasoma, but there's still a lot of power there. It's the old fight adage, you know, how do you stop a speedy guy? How do you stop the elusive guy? You take it to his body and you break him down. You put your weight on him, hit him with your own shots, clean knees to the body. Martin should also tell. maybe be looking for some up elbows there because both... His arms are above Kasoma's. It just looks like Avery is having the time of his life. Yeah, he's, he's doing a bit of bag work. He's clinching and, and kneeing. And it's effective. And it's frustrating for his opponent. Big teep there. You can see some unloading some shots here. Rattles Kasoma. Kasoma a little smile on his face. I think that the body work is starting to pay dividends because Soma is not the fighter that he was in the first two rounds. Yeah. And he's starting to eat big shots. You can see it in the legs as well. Very flat-footed now. He's still got some speedy kicks, but definitely not the bounce that he had early on in the fight. Big kick to the stomach of Kasoma and another elbow from Martin Avery. See some, I would not mind Martin standing back now in the pocket and giving some big body kicks. That's what it Roy. opens up. Invest in the body and then suddenly you have the time yeah, to operate from the Yeah, especially with the forward outside. pressure, you know, Kasoma's almost in a natural state now of just going backwards so that's where you you walk forward and as you as he drops his hand like that you throw that big kick he landed on there or well, i mean an elbow but this is just you know effective domination in the clinch doing the work breaking him down looking for that headshot there big swing for the miss of the elbow kasoma doing his best to stay in there it's a little sneaky elbow of his own 10 seconds in this round. Oh, big elbow to the mid, oh, sorry, knee to the mid section there. Great work from these guys. Hands go up again. Every round, both of them have walked off smiles, putting their hands in the air, giving the crowd a real display of good technical Muay Thai. Good technical tough guy competition. I mean, this has been all blood and tears right now. I mean, it's starting to pay off. The speed has certainly dropped off from Kasoma thanks to the investment in the body work by Martin Avery. Those knees to the stomach, to the thinner waistline of Kasoma has started to take its toll. And I think in the fifth round, you're going to see big dividends coming out. But Kasoma, tough as they come, he's hanging in there and he's not giving up. He's certainly not taking a step back, but he is definitely starting to eat big shots. Yeah, in this fifth and final round, it'll be interesting to see what his corner is telling him there. If they want him to stay on the outside, you know, maybe look for some big tips as Martin's coming in. Because at the moment, what he's doing is allowing him that space as he's coming in. He's trying to look for the, the kick to the leg, but he's not stopping Martin's momentum. And I, th I think he's definitely on the back foot here. So you have to look for him to keep him at bay and then maybe look for bigger shots. It's the fifth and final round. We're underway here at tier B4 as Kasoma takes the canvas. The blood spattered canvas before us. Don't forget, the main event is still to come. Tarholics Fight Promotions, full swing. It's going to be for the WMO International Welterweight oh, Championship over five work. rounds between Pasquale Amoroso of Italy.
the holder of the title, taking on challenger Nedo Gomba. That comes up next. And we're seeing Martin go back to work, doing what's worked for him this whole fight. Get in the clinch. There he throws that big body kick. And he's still, you know, he's, he's got his wits about him to look for that defense of the kicks when they're coming. He's checking. The only thing here yeah, that Pedro can hope for is maybe a big looping punch as Martin's coming in. But he looks pretty fatigued. His mouth's open. Yeah, the big heavily. looping punch. Where's the power going to come from? That is the problem. Yeah. You maybe just hope that as your opponent's walking in, he's also really fatigued. There's a big elbow, you know, something like that where something unexpected. They both tied didn't even flinch. Tough guy. Still walking, got his hands bobbing his head back and forth, slips his elbow in, in, in between the guard of Kosoma. Great work from Avery. I mean, he loves it here. You can see it. When I look up from the screen, I just see the way he's bobbing his head and he's, he's loving it. Oh, big it, shot there. Kosoma's neck rattled back. There's also a lot of subtle work that Avery is doing on the inside in the moving of the hands away from the target area of Pedro Kasoma. He's opening up holes in the defense just like that. Yeah, and he's bobbing his head side to side so you don't know which side the shot's going to come from. And then he grabs you and he clinches and he hits you with the knee. Good work there from Avery. I mean, this was just a Terminator-esque work coming forward, slipping, hitting those big shots. In his last round, he, he might even be looking for the finish. He's got a minute left to do it here. You know, Kosoma's fatigued. Both of the guys are pretty tired, but Martin's still got the forward momentum here. Shaking his head, saying, yes, let's get it. Let's get after it. Get some work. Deep inside the last minute of the last round, Avery up against Kosoma. England versus Angola. Slips a big elbow on the side of Kosoma's head. Working in the clinch. I don't think the referees had to jump in at all in this fight to stop a clinch. Because this has been constant work. <laughs> As I said that first time, he jumps in. The guys are tied up in the corner. 30 seconds left. Oh, big one from both guys. Elbow landing. Still going for that big elbow. Martin Avery. Windmills from Winchester. Oh, looping knee gets right to the midsection of Kosoma. Last 10 seconds, let's look at an exchange here. The guys are still throwing heavy leather and their feet <laughs> flying past each other's faces. Walking around, great fight from these guys. They get the appreciation from the crowd. Great work, boys. Just had to take the mic away there as I gave a couple of hooting whistles. What a great fight from these guys, clinching up, constant work, all smiles at the end. I see a mouth got spilled out there, I'm not sure who it belongs to, looking for the teeth. I think it was Martin Avery's. <laughs> Someone might remind him to go collect it after. But that was a great fight from the boys. Martin Avery, England born, fighting out of Kenya, up against Pedro Kosoma from Angola, fighting out of Angola top team. Great fight as we await the Referee, the judge's decision, sorry. Martin, in that last round, walking forward with looping elbows. He knew he was gonna have a static opponent in front of him. He flattened his feet out. He's leaning over the ropes here, shouting at me. Great work. I think they're ready to go another round. I think they enjoyed that too much. Good work from them. Right, the referee is about to bring them to the center. Give us the judge's decision. Ladies and gentlemen, a massive round of applause for these two warriors. They really laid it all out on the line and we go to the judge's scorecards. After five rounds of brutal action, your winner coming by way of unanimous decision victory, fighting out of Kenya and Winchester, England, Martin Avery! Martin Avery gets the unanimous decision. Pedro Kosoma had a, a look of confusion on his face. He maybe thought he did enough, but
But of course, he landed some good strikes, and maybe he felt that Martin's strikes weren't as effective, but certainly in the clinch, dominated, landed those knees, did the work that he needed to do, and walks away smiling. Look forward to seeing these guys again. We've got Pedro Kosoma up in the next fight, TFP, uh, sorry, in the next TFP event, TFP 5, level up, 23rd of July, 2022. But it'll be great as well to maybe see Martin Avery on the card again, see what he wants to do. He says he wants to be world champion with performances like that. You know, he might have been checking his way up the rankings there. Straight from the beginning, this is early on in the fight, you see Martin engaged in the clinch. He started on the outside, they both were exchanging with some big kicks, but as soon as he realized that he was dominating in the, in the clinch work with those knees, I think he just went to his go-to. But we love to see it, we love the way that they worked out of the clinch, they didn't have to get broken up <laughs> except for right at the end in the fifth round. Some good avoidance early on when, you know, Pedro had his feet on him a little bit better, but Martin was able to capitalize on some sweeps like this one, into the ropes. He caught a few catches and teeps and, and swept Pedro off his feet. So that might have also been what worked into Martin's favor in the judges' scorecards there. But definitely, you know, strikes landed, big shots. Pedro can hold his head high, did a great job there. I think he was just smothered. Martin doing the necessary work. Found the hole, got in there and, and did, did the damage to get the win. What a great way to set up our final fight of the night. World Muay Thai Organization International Welterweight title on the line. There's a sneaky elbow I was speaking about. You know, as he missed with the one, he just rotated his shoulder over and landed that one on the bottom of Kasoma's chin, wobbled him a bit. And I think after that it was, you know, just Martin realizing, I've got this in the bag, let me get to work. Pinch up, hit the shots. Braces. Pedro wasn't shy to, to exchange as well when he had the openings there, marching with every now every so often, drop his hands and you know eat a big shot, but the way he smiled when he came back. Ladies and gentlemen, the final bout on this evening's card is sanctioned by the South African Muay Thai Organization and the World Muay Thai Organization. It's time to create space and go for the KO. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. Five rounds of action for the WMO International Welterweight Championship. Introducing to you first, the challenger fighting out of the blue corner with the height of 1.65 meters tall, blue trunks and weighing in at 64.5 kilograms. An excellent professional record, 61 wins, five losses, two draws. He fights out of Iron Tiger, Cape Town, South Africa. He is a five-time WMC champion, the 19th ranked welterweight in the world. Presenting the WMO Africa Welterweight Champion, fighting out of South Africa. Please welcome Nero Nintendo Gomba.
And it's now come time to introduce to you the champion. Fighting out of the red corner, standing 1.75 meters tall with the trunk colors of red and weighing in at 67.1 kilograms. With a professional record, 33 wins, nine losses, three draws. He fights out of the Venzio Gem, Nola Campania in Italy. He is the former Italian national and European champion, ranked number 11 in the world by the World Muay Thai Organization, presenting the reigning, defending WMO International Welterweight Champion, Pasquale Amaros. So... Oh, I am. I am too, and we there are feeling go. it. We are on comms, <laughs> yeah, Kevin Curry here, yeah, along with Cole Bergman. It's been a fantastic fight card. The whole night has been spectacular. Ty Hollick's fight promotions, main event of the evening, the WMO International Welterweight Champion, number 19 in the world versus number 11, South Africa versus Italy. Amoroso defending his title up against Gomba. Guys looking to put a stamp on you. You know, holding the international belt means that you just that inching your way closer to that that world title. I know Neto has been a former WMC world world title holder. He's the current WMO African champion in the welterweight division, a stadium champion in Thailand, lived many years there, over 60 fights to his credit, including the likes of Sanchai and so on. You know, the guys worked around. Amoroso, an Italian champion in 2019 and European WMO champion in 2019 too. He won the belt last year, the international WMO champion, 2021. Also got an impressive fight record with 45 fights and 33 wins to his name. So this is set to be a cracker. And you know what the beauty of this? Both guys in their absolute athletic prime. Nero, 28 years old, Amoroso, 27 years old. Big height difference going the way of Amoroso. I'm sure he's used to that kind of difference. And I'm sure that Gomba is used to being the shorter guy in so many of the fights that he's had. And he's had an illustrious career, built largely overseas, built largely in Asia. He's had a lot of fights on him, and especially in Thailand, where it counts as the real world of Muay Thai. Not to say that this isn't, but this is a step up in competition for both these guys. Yeah, I guess it's also features maybe a little bit like a second coming for Nedo, you know, like he had all that, that accolades that he was gathering out there, had a bit of a small break, came back to South Africa. Finally, we, you know, we had the break during COVID, but now we're back on full swing. That's why we named this event that, you know, we have a big crowd here, world title on the line here, international title. We had some South African titles, you know, we're getting back into the swing of things and it's great to see these guys putting on a show for us. Amoroso's white crew, short, sharp, cheerful, and done. Gomba soaking it all up, taking the plaudits from the crowd. A heavy Iron Tiger army has crept up behind us. As the evening's gone on, they've gotten closer and closer to they're just about scratching my shoulder now. We felt the eyes on us. We turned around, and they were right there, inching up as close as they could to the ring. And that pre-fight silence. Yeah, feel palpable tension in there. These guys are going to come out hard. You know, Nedo likes to work the elbow game up the inside, so we'll see that now, especially with the Ranger opponent looping in, looking for that. I haven't seen Amoroso, I haven't watched any of his tape. But I mean, he's the international champion for a reason. 
And I'm going to tell you, there was a yeah. problem on the scale yesterday for Amoroso. He came in slightly heavy. He refused to lose the weight for the first couple of minutes, maybe about 40 minutes. But then after, bang, the excess weight off after a bit of a discrepancy. Here he is. Let's see how that weight is going to translate coming down the stretch of this fight. Yeah, I think there was a bit of a discrepancy on what they felt the actual ruling was on the, on the weight division. Um, you know, the, the weight divisions actually have point scales in them. So this one's 66.67, not 67 on the nose, which he came in at thinking that he was all right. But he eventually cut the weight, you know, he did what he needed to do. He's a professional. And he's the holder of the title. Yeah, for he sure. He doesn't so want to cough it up for so just pushing a couple I mean, of grams. We've seen these things in world titles. Great work from these guys, both busy sizing each other up here. Not a, a very fast start, but but uh, there's power in the strikes. You know, Neto actually landing on his target, finding, he's checking everything very calm. Like the way he's approaching this fight. And presenting the southpaw stance. You can also see his body tatted up with the Sakyans. Yeah, so let's have a look. Tattoo-wise, what's the difference between Avery that we saw before and Gombo? What story is different that you can read here? Well, both of them having the, the Muay Thai power tigers on their backs and the script lines, which are also like defensive scripts. So they're actually quite similar. The two main tattoos that Ned had on his back are the same as Avery. Avery just has a lot more of them and a couple others as well. Back to the action we go. Gomba up against Amoroso, the main event at TFP for full swing. Big power shots coming from Neto. He's landing those body shots. Even his punches are, are landing. You know, he's taking one or two little ones, but I don't think they with the same oomph that he's delivering his shots with. A little sneaky elbow there from Amoroso. Neto jumps up, looks for her, the flying elbow to the head. Amoroso puts his leg up and, and defends himself from that. Now, what's strange about that is you do see the un unusual and the extraordinary coming from Gomba, but normally he waits a couple of rounds before he starts dishing that out. Yeah, I think, I think he's maybe looking, he's seeing openings, you know, he's maybe trying to give Amoroso something to think about early on. So he maybe puts him, instead of having him coming forward and using his like range, he's going to say, okay, you need to actually be on the back foot. I'm the guy coming forward, jumping in, making you think a bit. But these guys are, are throwing at some big, some big bombs here. Powerful strikes, Nero using his own tip to keep Amoroso at bay. Whoa, guys get caught up in each other's ankles there. Now, Amoroso, one of the fights that I got to see was uh, taking place against a guy called Manchai. And he lost that fight by dislocating his elbow from a front kick that was landed on his shin. His shins got taken out from underneath him. He put his arm down to try and break the fall. He ended up dislocating his elbow, stood right back up, and Manchai kicked his elbow a few times before he decided it was too much, and the referee called an end to that bout. Manchai, a super strong kicker as well. Like, I mean... That's, if, you, if you're talking about that sort of range, he's, he's definitely brought up against some of the best as well. I think he's got also a sack on his back. I can't see exactly, but it might be Hanuman. Nice work there from Neto to keep uh, Amoroso at bay. We've tried to also jump in there with a looping strike. Big high kicks coming from Amoroso. He's got some playful work. I like the way he brings that left leg up, maybe stabs a little teeth and then switches into a kick. Great round from both guys there, very tight. Neto did some good work on the inside. Amoroso playful on the outside. Great opening first round. First round in the can, the action is all here. It's getting thick and faster and it starts to really just build that crescendo till in the end we're getting a third, fourth and fifth round that is all out violence. That is Muay Thai. The toughest sport on planet Earth when it comes to stand up in my opinion. Trying to assess the body language in the corners here. You know, the guy's not giving too much away. Um, standing, standing. Yeah, both standing, Neto facing away. You know, sometimes you don't want to look at your opponent. Some guys do. Off comes the ankle guard, one of them. Is that on Neto? On Neto, yeah. He just got pulled off by his coach, Shaheen Price. Maybe feeling like they hindering his mobility a bit. You know, he likes to be a bit fancy. I saw maybe he feels like that's not actually helping him right now. He looks a little bit frustrated in the corner. I'm not just sure why. He had a good round. Funny, Warsaw with his back turned to his opponent as though it's not so that he's showing too much of what's going on. Yeah. Also, just a, a general way for him to just chill out on the edge of the ring there. But yeah, great level that we've seen from these guys here. World level of Muay Thai in Cape Town, South Africa, as the chant of Nero rises up behind our shoulder crowd back in the local year a year. Amoroso electing not to use the, the water catch. 
The World Muay Thai Organization's belt is on the line, the international welterweight version of it. Another four rounds to come. Gomba up against Amoroso. Yeah, I liked what I saw from both fighters there. You know, Amoroso, he's using his range effectively. Neto was finding a few sneaky, getting inside. I think he was catching Amoroso unawares there. Big looping kick from Neto. Cracks on the side of the body. Amoroso's got a good defense, especially since he's the length there fighter, you'd assume that he wouldn't be so much on the outside. And it seems Amoroso has had the desired effect on Gomba. It's bringing out the best in him, and he's certainly putting on the pressure. He's quick with those little inside snappy kicks, you know, breaking the momentum. Gomba is very sturdy fighter. He likes to walk his opponents down. But Amoroso is doing a good job of just disrupting that, that forward momentum, that Terminator style. Inside leg kick landed by Gomba. Hope you're going to see a lot more of those onto the big power leg of Amoroso. You can obviously see what's working well for Nero is those body strikes, catching Amoroso on the arm there. Got some big welts, some bruising. <laughs> nice little dance there. Dances off. Amoroso is not phased. He, he keeps a poker face, comes forward. He's like, I'll play that game. I'll play that card. Nero catches. Nice push off with the knee. Gomba's looking Sweeps like he's getting feet. comfortable into this fight so now. He's comfortable, he's got to be careful, he doesn't walk into too much. Especially the Albert as he's on the, on the forward march. Oh, big, big uppercut. uppercut. But Neto eats it like a Terminator. Didn't even register. But he, re he registered in terms of bringing his guard up, putting his elbow across his face and the long guard. That's one way also to help prevent those uppercuts slipping from the inside. Amoroso is doing a great job of disrupting the oncoming attack from Nido Gomba. Yeah, and I think what's also happening with us in commentary is we're getting drawn into the strikes, not really watching what's going on in the overall. But I guess that's the judge's job now. But both fighters, you know, they're, they're both landing, they're both doing good work to, to disrupt their opponent's pressure. Amoroso looks for a sneaky elbow on the top of Neto's head. It's a target right in front of him there. Kick to the groin, gets waved off, carries on. Big butt, big kicks to the big looping punch from Neto. Checks that kick, mouth open a little bit. Gomba's doing well with the inside leg kicks. He's just coming short when it comes to the attacks with his hands upstairs. And that's the height that is paying into the advantage of Amoroso. Yeah. I think he's really got to make an investment of killing the knee area and getting the inside leg kicks going. And I think Nedo, these guys are also switching between their stances, but I think he needs to look for some of those big looping shots. His, his leg kicks from the back foot when he's in the southpaw position. Because those are landing flush on the arm. There's a big leg kick from him. So he needs to try and focus on those kicks. He's got a lot more power in his kicks. I think Amoroso's kicks are quick. He's rangy and his punches are good. And but there's not as much power in those big kicks. He's fighting like the bigger guy. He's not giving any of his heights away. For and sure. he's doing a lot of good work disrupting the attack of Gomba on the inside. Amoroso now taking a few big breaths. Didn't see that after the first round. Still standing, both guys. Standing in the corners, electing not to take the seat. Right, stick your neck out. What are we doing in the first two rounds here, Carl Bergman? Hmm. <laughs> I think in the first round, I'd say that Nero did enough to, to steal that one. The second round may be going in the favor of Amoroso, keeping him at bay, uh, looking for those long shots, the range, and disrupting Nedo a lot. Like, you know, every time there we have Nedo looking for a sneaky trip, but he gets pushed off. He comes in for a jumping kick and he gets, you know, defended. So I think defensively Amoroso is doing a good job. Some big shots in this round as well. Frustrating Nedo. It'll be interesting to see how, how Nedo comes into the third round. You see, when he, when he looks for those big looping shots, that's when he actually catches him because Amoroso is not necessarily moving off the line. He's using his range to stop, but nedo has got big, long kicks that he can find that range with. He needs to maybe do less of the punching or trying to find the chin and maybe just work on more kicks on the leg, kick to the body. My gut feel from watching that last round was more of a story of Nero just coming up short. Yeah. Excuse the pun. There you go. Big body shot. 
See, it's only when in that case where he's slipped the kick and he has that he's on the inside, but he needs to hit that body shot every time, that big kick to the body. So and stop, stop looking for the punches, really. Shutting down the space. It's the first time we've seen the guys get into the clinch. Big body shot there. That's another thing he can do is maybe punch to the body. Instead of trying to punch to the head, he can go, you know, target the body here. And that'll pay dividends going further into the round. But I mean, so far in this round, he's done a good job. We're almost a minute in. Defended well. Good leg kick by Gomba. Yeah, Amorosa's Mar sting on his punches also seems to be dropping off a little bit. Big elbow there. I'm not sure if that landed from the what we saw on the, the screen here. Yeah. You'd never know from Gomba. He doesn't <laughs> flinch. <laughs> oh, big uppercut lands there. Body shot. Another body knee. That uppercut paying dividends for Amoroso. Nedo needs to maybe keep that long guard, keep that left arm up. Work the body more, look for the kicks. Hit that body, look for the kicks. He's got him in the corner here. Maybe a chance to clinch up again, but those body shots are definitely paying off. I'm looking at, at Amoroso's face. He's wincing when that, when that body shot's coming in. And it's going to be, you know, sapping that energy again. Like we saw in the last fight, those body shots drain you. Even if you're the guy that's well conditioned, the more shots you take to the body, the more fatigue starts to set in. Now we've seen Gomba as a danger with his back to the ropes. He's good at climbing up and landing elbows from the top. We saw it in his last fight at Continental Collision. Beautiful counter shot by Nino Gomba. It's a, a tight round here. Both guys landing some good shots. Nino working well when he goes to the body. Coming up a little bit short, as you said, when he goes for the head, just like that shot, you know, looping miss shot. Like to see him work the body a bit more and just much more of those kicks. Amoroso leaning into his, his uh, boxing now. Gomba is starting to pay dividends. He's drawing the attack out of Amoroso. Amoroso is throwing three or four, sapping his energy, leaving gaps open, and Gomba's coming up with one accurate one. Yeah, that seems to be the measure of play right now in this round. Good work there. Smiling it off. Yeah, Big kick. Both legs landing there. Amoroso, you know, he's also reactive. So every time that, that Nero hits him, he tries to come back a little bit one, two stronger. Big kick. Amoroso has got a bit of damage under his left eye. Keep an eye on it. It's not massive right now, but it could become massive if Gomba keeps zoning in on it. Nero hitting that leg from the outside. Again, goes for the big body shot. Maybe needs to look up with the, with a jab and then follow through with that body shot straight right down the pipe. Guys, touch gloves at the end of the third round. Interesting round to score. Very. There's that wall that we were speaking about, that bruising, maybe a light cut under the eye. His body definitely damaged, touched up. Now he elects to take the seat. That's what I was wondering about. When are we going to see these guys start to show some signs of fatigue? Definitely, you know, he's sitting down, he's breathing heavily. I think that, that body work that we were speaking about starting to pay dividends for Nero. Nero Nero's still standing. He might even be, you know, warming up for the third and fourth round. Actually, this fourth and fifth round now. I think that round took a lot more out of Amoroso than he's willing to show us in the fight itself. But he's showing us on the stool right now. His mouth was hanging open. His gob was coming out of his mouth without any control of it. He looks like he's getting into a war. Yeah, and one of the things that we said that, you know, we're looking at Amoroso and he's quite reactive. So that also takes a lot of energy out of you. You know, he's eating that shot, that's sapping. Then you're now loading up on your shots, right? You're eating one, trying to give a big one back. Sometimes he's missing, sometimes he's landing, sometimes he's swinging right past. That's energy sapping as well. So it's interesting to see what he does now if he maybe, you know, takes an approach of just standing a bit, uh, absorbing, maybe looking a bit more to check instead of, you know, eating a shot, giving a shot. That's quite a, a big thing for him to think about now. Pressure of the two, definitely Nero Gomba. Rounds three, four, and five are on their way. Sorry, Fourth four and five. Underway. We are flying through this fight. See, there's, there's, there's a lot of... I would say a lot of action from Amoroso, but they're not at the, the shots are kind of glancing, not as strong. He's also trying to like maybe wake his legs up a bit by bouncing a bit. 
is he able to sustain this output? That's the thing. Yeah, that's the other thing. So that's also tiring. Maybe, you know, he's not throwing as hard, but he's throwing in volume and he's bouncing a lot in speed. Neto coming back to work the body now. As you said earlier, that Terminator approach, walking forward, taking a shot down there, but definitely landing the more aggressive, powerful strikes. Slipping there and gives a big hook to the body. Amoroso wins the bit. How's that ribcage? I mean, the fact that, that he's got that long, exposed body, Neto's right there for those big punches. He's looking oh. for that, he's landing those kicks, he's being aggressive, he's even putting him up against the, the ropes now. He's fighting like the bigger guy. Yeah. And we're also doing his best not to back down, but you can see that, you know, the reaction as well, the way he moved his head away there, expecting something, but nothing came. Mouth is open. Possibly a chance for Neto to get a big looping overhand here. Neto also breathing a little bit heavy, but definitely looking a lot more composed. Decided this. Yeah, great catch and release. What's often been happening is he's been catching the kicks on Marosa. Marosa puts his knee in and pushes him off. That was a good idea from Neto there to catch it, release it, and return with the kick. You see, carry on working that body, even though we're in the fourth round, you know, slow your opponent down. There was an acknowledgement it's, it's of the points. overhand right from Nito Gomba, thrown by Amoroso with a bad intention. Crowd's gone surprisingly quiet here. This round is on a knife edge right now. Neto's just got to stay focused, work that body the way he was doing in the beginning of the round. Amoroso, not really much in his strikes, you know, he's done well to, to land a few big punches in the round though, so he's also making sure that Neto doesn't just walk in without any disregard and has to be careful not to eat too big shots. Neto keeping him at bay now with those teeps. 30 seconds left in the round. Gomba's definitely feeling it. There's no doubt that his mouth is hanging a little wider open than it has the entire fight so far. And it would be. Both these guys working. The work rate has been high. You know, they've both been eating shots too. Neto getting a bit playful now. 20 seconds left in this round. And also taps his glove. This could quite conceivably be an Amoroso round. I still think Neto did enough to touch him up in the early rounds. And I don't think that, that, Amoroso, that Amoroso strikes have been that lethal, you know? So it's, it's, it's about volume of strikes, but also about effective striking. So Neto might not be landing as many shots as Amoroso, but he's definitely landing with, with ill intent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you are watching us live on YouTube. Of course, it's Tireholics Fight Promotion. Click, like, and subscribe. Share it with all your friends. Share it around on Facebook as well. Follow us on Facebook, Tireholics Fight Promotions. And on Instagram, Tireholics underscore fight underscore promotions. Of course, TFP number five level up event coming your way 23rd of July 2022 here at the Grand West Casino and Entertainment World in Cape Town, South Africa. It's going to be a mixed card, pros, pro-ams and amateurs. The main event yet to be announced in the coming weeks. Look out for that information coming through. Anthony Mailer makes his return. Shane Deacon making a defense. Ishak Ibrahim, of course, making a defense of his title. And of course, you can get the merch. Please info, uh, email your information to admin at tireholics.com. Right, so take a quick look at these replays here in the fourth penultimate round. Neto doing well with that big body shot. I think he recognized that, you know, when he catches, he can, he can do some damage there. It's difficult to go head hunting when your opponents are tall. So that's what I liked in that round. The effect of striking to the body, some good kicks, keeping Amoroso at bay. Amoroso landing some good shots of his own. And in reply, definitely a very reactive fighter. The whistle gets blown for seconds out. The crowd trying to pick their fight up. L last round, some work to be done. It's a very close fight. The pants go up a level. <laughs> level up. That's TFP5. <laughs> All right, guys, hug it out. Last Final round, round of the night, man. We are so pumped for this. We're also trying to bring some, some of that energy to his legs. He's him bouncing again the way he did in the beginning of the fourth. But I mean, those strikes, not very hard, but disruptive. Neto right coming with hand. the power. But I think he's going chin hunting now. He maybe also feels like he's a bit behind on the card. On the judges' scorecards, I mean. He also does have a nice style, a flowing style with his punching as well. Like, he lands the one and then brings that uppercut in. What is that? Tip to the groin. 
Both guys are starting to fight like they're down on the scorecards. Good tip there from Amoroso. Neto's going to have to get that back. He needs to get avenge that specific move. I think he needs to start working off his power side. Just like that, he needs to throw those kicks, work the body, big punches. That big hook that he used in, in the, the last round worked really well. Amoroso's doing, doing a good job of just picking him off on the outside. Disrupting him. Yeah, and completely just staying at work. Maybe not big shots, but that's definitely stopping Neto's momentum. And you know, in this fifth round, those are still shots that you're going to feel. A big, big right, big right straight from Neto. He catches, drops it. Working forward. Amoroso staying active, making sure that he keeps Neto at bay. But as you can see, those strikes, they're landing on Neto, but they're not doing anything to him necessarily in damage-wise. It's just He's disruption. looking for the big shots. Minute and a half left in this fight. Amoroso, some lazy kicks, but still effective on that side. Neto catches, big looping shot. Not jumps much in, landing. Jumps in with his shin and knee. I think in, in this last minute, it's the time for Neto to switch it up and actually start working, throwing volley shots. You know, he's been, he's been using a lot of one power shot here, power kick there, but if he starts opening up a bit of combinations, if he's still got something in the tank, he's going to find something landing. on his hands are low, his defense is not too great at the moment. Final minute, final 45 seconds. I'm so mesmerized just watching this. I forgot I'm commentating for a second. I'm at home watching this on my TV. Neto doing well. Still landing some power shots here. Final 30 seconds of the round. The international WMO welterweight belt on the line. Both guys giving their all in this five rounds. What a round it's the been. The coaches, the crowd pushing them on, egging them on. 15 seconds to go. 10 seconds, here we go, lost, Hail Mary. Neto gives a big loop, he strike to the back of the head, comes in, grabs in the clinch, and that is all she wrote. Amoroso kisses Neto on the cheek, walks away, pumps his fist in there, Neto jumps on the ropes. Tough one to call, both these guys think they might have it in the bag. I think Amoroso thinks he's Hold on to his belt. Wondering if we can see a bit of Nedo's reaction here. Great fight from these guys. Doing the necessary. Nedo looking for the big power shots. Amoroso staying on the outside, making sure that his short opponent doesn't get in and you know, do any major damage. Did well even in the late rounds just to keep picking at Nedo. Nedo did well to hit some of those big body shots. I guess we'll see what the referees are counting now. Strikes landed, effectiveness of strikes, uh, domination, moving the guys around the ring. Both guys walking around as the judges are making the decision. There's some deliberation here. Not sure what's happening, but they strutting around the ring with their hands in the air. All right, looks like we maybe have a decision here. Devon Curra stepping into the ring. Referee Jean-Dre Blaine calls the guys to the middle for the announcement. And crew Nicholas Radley bringing in the international belt. WMO, World Muay Thai Organization, international welterweight belt. 66.67 kgs. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give both of these fighters a massive round of applause. <laughs> Awarding the belt to the winner will be Nicholas Bradley, the co-president of the South African Muay Thai organization, as well as the organizer here at Thai Holics Fight Promotions. A big round of applause for Nicholas Bradley, please. And we go to the judges' scorecards. After five rounds of absolute war, ladies and gentlemen, your winner coming by way of unanimous decision victory. And still, the WMO in
International Welterweight Champion, retaining his title by unanimous decision victory, Italian Pasquale Amoroso. Pasquale Amoroso does enough to get the judges' decision. Five rounds of war with Nedo Gomba. The pulp falls off his waist. He's so excited. No man to pick it up with. His coach does the drop for him. Beats crew Nicholas Radley in the center. The belt stays around his waist. Great job he did there to keep Ned on the outside, pick him off, and just do the job he needed to do and get his belt back on that plane going home. As we play out with Pasquale Amoroso, the victor in this main event at TFP number four. We look forward to TFP five coming your way 23rd of July. Carl Bergman, it's been an absolute pleasure announcing these fights with you. Thank you so much. Cheers, my my name is Devin Curra. It's been an absolute pleasure announcing and commentating my way through this magical tournament. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see you soon. TFP 5, level up, 23rd of July, 2022.